your thoughts are going out into the field. They're broadcasting <laughs> energy. And the energy of your thoughts entangles with the energy of the world around you and in a major sense determines and shapes the painting that you just mentioned of ourselves or who we are. Uh, and when people awake to this, that's when they come, I can't remember the name of that other population that you just mentioned. Not but once. the moment you're awake, all of a sudden it's, well, wait a minute, I can change the program. I go, ah, that's the game. That's the winner. And you go, pro? Program. Uh, so let me let me just introduce this because it's profoundly important. The brain is a computer. It's not like a computer. It is the most fabulous computer on planet Earth is the human brain. And I go, so what? I go, but it functions in the same way that the laptop or desktop computer that you have works in the same way. And I go, what is it? I say, well, let's go back. In the old days, you buy a computer and you take it home and you plug it in and you start it and the screen boots up. And I say, okay, you got a brand new computer. Let's do something. Thing and you go, well, I can't. I said, what do you mean? You got a brand new computer. Said, First, I have to put programs in the computer. Then I can access the computer. I go, this is exactly true for the human brain. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I watch these videos every day because I need them for motivation. Being around successful entrepreneurs every morning helps me believe that I can do great things too. It's like your morning coffee, but for your goals, kickstarting your day with a blast of positivity. So here is a challenge for you. Try watching one video every morning for the next 30 days. And let's find out together if they help you do great things too. If you're in, leave a hashtag believe in the comments below so I can celebrate with you. So today, let's get some incredible motivation from the one and only Bruce Lipton, Believe. Three months before you're born, the screen lights up, boom, you're, you're on. Yeah, but you got no programs. I go, well, where do you get the programs from? You read the environment. You watch the environment. And especially right after birth, the most important thing is this. A child's brain for seven years is in a state of hypnosis. I go, why? Because, let me ask a question, how many rules does it take to be a functional member of a family? Uh, how many rules does it take to be a functional member of that community? I go, thousands of rules. I say, you're going to take an infant, put him in school, give him a book and say, read these rules so you can be a member of a family? It's like, an infant can't do that. Nature created the first seven years of that child's life in a state of brain function called theta, which is hypnosis. I go, what's the point? Well, how do you learn the rules? You watch. You watch your parents and you download their behavior. You watch your siblings. You download your, their behavior. You watch the community and download their behavior. So I say, what's in your subconscious mind? Programs. Yeah. Where'd you get them from? Watching other people. So I said, do those programs support your wishes and desires? And I go, rarely <laughs> do they do that. But your programs, you needed to get it into the computer. By age seven, You've downloaded the functional programs of how to, you know, be a citizen here, okay? And then what? Then you become conscious at age seven. And that's when you can type on the keyboard and put your information into the computer. And all of a sudden, I say, well, that's because you are a creator. Your thoughts are going to put the information in and your brain is going to use the computation of that to manifest a life that matches the thought. Positive thinking can heal you of any disease. Negative thinking can create any disease. It can even kill you. You believe you're going to die? You're, that's a belief. And I say, so belief, the picture is translated into chemistry brain, and the chemistry via the blood goes to the cells and controls genetics and behavior. So your thoughts are the primary control of your genes. And I go, significance, just simple conclusion. The old story, what is called genetic determinism, genes determine the character of your life, that's what most people learn, is, is no longer valid. Uh, it, it is now recognized uh, that the genes are receptive to the signal that you send them. And all of a sudden I say, well, then your thoughts are overriding your genes. I go, yes, they do. And then I conclusion, which Mark has been talking about for years, is, well, then you better start thinking healthy thoughts. <laughs> Because it's the negative thoughts that put the chemistry in that that will create any disease. Uh, and, and all of a sudden it goes positive thinking, negative thinking, but it's all connected to belief. It is simply impossible to achieve long-term health and happiness if you hate yourself. 
hundred percent. This is so important because this is, that was, I have a memory of a point in my life where that changed just like, boom, just like somebody turned the switch because I, I was on the edge of, I could have been diagnosed as manic depressive. Well, I'm happy most of the time, but once it started going wrong, mm -hmm. then it was like, this is wrong. And then I give myself the abuse verbally. Oh, not, you're stupid. You're not good enough. What, what's wrong with you, Lipton? And I'd be doing that. And I, I was in my lab and I, I just spent a, a procedure that took about an hour to to prepare for the experiment. And uh, and if you mess it up just a little bit, you have to start all over again. The third time that day, I messed it all up. And now I'm really upset. I spent the whole damn day doing this. It didn't work. And then I'm getting, oh, you idiot, you can't do anything right. And I was giving myself like a parent on my shoulder telling me where you're, that's not good enough. And I'll never forget, There, I was alone in the lab and I hear this voice <laughs> and I, there's nobody there. I hear this voice, like, you know, and, and the voice says, don't you have anything better to do than to listen to this crap? And I looked around. I started to laugh because I said, sure, I'd rather go to a movie. So there was a newspaper. I picked up the paper. I found a movie, went off to the theater. Guess what? That whole dialogue ended instantly. I had a choice. I had. That's what it was saying. I have a choice. Do you want to continue this conversation or do you want to do something else? That was the moment of empowerment that was so great because it said, stop, <laughs> stop, do something else, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the uh, next time I started to get a little depressed, first thing that came back was the humor of that. And I'd laugh and i go, okay, I'll do something else. After three or four times, guess what? I've never been depressed since that time. Never. Why? It just doesn't hold in my mind. If a, if a depression, you know, like a negative thing starts happening, I don't sit there and play it over and over and over again, which makes you go downhill, downhill. I just, oh, I don't, I have a choice. It's a choice. Do I want to listen to this stuff or do I want to do something else? The movie, The Matrix, everyone thinks science fiction. I go, no, 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 that's a documentary. Everybody yeah. got programmed. That's a fact. That's a biological right. reality. Right. But what was interesting, they always said, well, there's a red pill. And if you take the red pill, you get out of the program. And I go, guess what? Almost everybody in our audience is taking that red pill at one time. Changed their life. Yes. Go, when was that? It turns out science has recognized that when you fall in love, mm. you stop playing the programs and you start creating from your conscious mind. Mm -hmm. and wishes and desires are conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And so once you let go of the program and you start creating wishes and desires, it's called the honeymoon. Yes. You created this heaven on earth experience. And I go, and here's the inside story that Michael's been telling you for years, but I can now tell you, you could have that every day for every day of your whole life. Yes. Because we created that. And if you understand you created it, then you can say, well, why don't I create it tomorrow? And I go, you can create it every day. That's the beautiful part. Hi, I'm Bruce Lipton, author of the best-selling books, The Biology of Beliefs, Spontaneous Evolution, and The Honeymoon Effect. I'm here to thank Evan Carmichael for featuring me on his YouTube channel, and I want to let you know that Evan is giving away links where you can watch the first episodes of my special Gaia series entitled Inner Evolution for free. Evan is making this offer to thank you for watching this video. You will find the links in the description section below. Thank you. Everyone thinks disease is related to genes, and I'll tell you what, less than 1% of disease is connected to genes, that up to 90% of illness is stress-related. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, what's the consequence? I'll tie it into the corporate thing in a second, because the first two uh, consequences of putting stress hormones in your body are, let's go back a few hundred thousand years when the only stress was the saber-toothed tiger chasing you. So stress is based on your ability to escape. Uh, and your ability to escape is to use your arms and legs. And I said, well, yeah, well, you want all the energy in your arms and legs because, you know, uh, you, you don't have to worry about the gallbladder right now. That's not relevant. The cyber, saber tooth tiger's coming. So uh, there are three things that I want to bring up. So very number one, the first, the first two are physical. Okay. Number one is stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the gut, this area, to shut down. In fact, when you first feel fear, there's like a butterflies in the stomach, queasy feeling. That's actually the blood vessel squeezing shut. And I say, why should the blood vessel squeeze shut? It's like, you don't need to maintain the body if you're trying to escape the tiger. So by squeezing the blood vessel shut, you send the blood to the arms and legs, more, more energy. Uh, and most important part, especially in today's world, is 
that stress hormones shut down the immune system. That's a function. Uh, it's so effective that w when a doctor wants to transplant an organ into a foreign person and they don't want the recipient's immune system to reject it, they give the patient stress hormones before the transplant because stress hormones shut down the immune system. Reason is simple. If you've ever been sick, sometimes you don't even have the energy to get out of bed. <laughs> and I go, well, you know, if you have a bacterial infection and a saber-toothed tiger chasing you, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> who cares about the damn bacteria? Because if the tiger catches you, the bacteria is not really a problem anymore. Uh, and so the uh, immune system is shut down, which opens us up to a problem. And in today's stressed out world, the, uh, the amount of illness on this planet with all the money we put into healthcare is rising all of the time. And I go, it's because of the stresses that we're, we're dealing with that's causing this. 90% of health issues on this planet, 90% probably more, is due to stress. What does that mean? I say that the chemistry of stress in the blood negatively impacts the body. Originally, just to make a difference, why would the body have a problem with, you know, dealing with the stress? Because I said, when the body is evolving, what stress did we actually have? I'll give example. A saber-toothed tiger is chasing us. I said, that's a moment of stress, folks. And I said, what happens? The stress hormones go into the body and they prepare you for running, fight or flight. Then you get away from that tiger and guess what? No more stress. So how long did that take? 10, 15 minutes. Okay. I go, so when we had stress in our history and in our evolution, it was only for a very short period of time, just temporarily get the body ready for fight or flight, just temporary. But today, stress is every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. All of us are under stress. Do you have enough money? Will you be able to get health care? Will you be able to pay the rent? My God, there's stress all the time. This is why we have a health care crisis. Okay. And I say, why? The chemistry of stress. And I'll explain it in three steps. This is the result of stress. So you understand where the problem comes from. When you're in fight or flight, your mission is to run away from the saber tooth tiger. And I go, so what does that mean? I say, well, you need all the energy in your body to run away from the tiger. And I say, well, what systems do I need to run away from the tiger? I say, well, mainly your arms and legs, because that's going to carry you away. And I say, okay. And I say, so why is that important? I said, because that's where you need the blood. Why? The blood is the energy to make those arms and legs move. So the more blood you have in the muscles uh, and the arms and legs, the more powerful you are to run away from the, the problem. Okay. So I go, so where was the blood if there was no stress? And I go, oh, what else is in the body? Take the arms and legs off the body. What do you got left? You've got the gut, the viscera. You got the guts. And I say, well, what do they do? I say, oh, they maintain the body. They clean it, filter it, put nutrients into it, remove waste products, replace the cells that are damaged, blah, blah, blah. I go, oh, so the gut is where all the maintenance of my body is being taken care of. And I go, yes. Now, here's the point. You're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. You think that you need to do all the work on the body right now? Maybe you could just like have an air raid siren or something and say, look, stop work. <laughs> we're going, we're going to run. I say, well, what happens? And here's what it is. The stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the gut to constrict tight. I go, what does that mean? It pushes the blood from the gut to the arms and legs. That's the one I need to run with. Yeah, but what does it mean about the gut? And I say, it stops functioning. The maintenance of the body's out. Taking care of the system is out. Why? The energy is getting ready to run. So you, the moment the stress hormones are in, you stop maintaining the body. Number two, and this is the big one. You ready? Stress hormones shut off the immune system. Oh, yeah. I say, why is that important? Well, if you've ever been sick, you might have known maybe you didn't even have the energy to get out of bed. When the immune system is operating like that, it uses so much energy, you probably can't even move sometimes. I go, yep. So I say you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. You have a bacterial infection. How do you want to split the energy? How much energy do you want to fight that bacteria? Back? Or how much energy do you want to run away from the tiger? Let me help you with the answer. 
You want all the energy to run away from the tiger. So stress hormones, listen to this. Stress hormones shut off the immune system to conserve energy to escape the stress. Oh, my God. That means the more stressed you're under, the less effective your immune system is because his stress hormones are shutting it down. I said there were three things, and the third one is also very important. When you're in a fight or flight, it's not time to think. And I say, what does that mean? I say, well, thinking is a very slow process. I ask you to think about something. You go, oh, I go, when you're running away from the tiger, you don't have to go, oh, you don't have time for that. You got to run. <laughs> so stress hormones shut off thinking reprogramming my subconscious mind to do what get rid of or replace the disempowering programs with empowering ones and i go here's the benefit here's the benefit of it once the new program is in you don't have to even make any effort why you haven't made any effort to get where you are right now. <laughs> it's your subconscious been doing it all the time. So I said, well, what if you put only good stuff in your subconscious? I go, well, then without any effort, you will have all the good things that you were looking for, health and happiness and relationships and stuff like that. And that's the destination because you got to get out that's of beautiful. I'm a victim. Everyone thinks they're a victim. I go, well, what does victim mean? Powerless. And so if I'm, I'm telling you I'm powerless, then what do you think is going to happen? And as you went like that before, Nance, resist. I'll sell you some power. I'll be the pharmaceutical. You want some power? I'll sell you this drug. Okay, I'm this guy. I'll sell you that. You'll get more power, more power. What did they do? They made us in, into consumers. Why? Well, I can't do it. I'm the victim. But they can get it for me. How much do I pay them? I say, well, hey, religion was based on all this stuff. Yeah, how, how much the, does it cost me not to go to hell? Well, 10% of your salary was tithing. <laughs> I go, for what? They're going to protect me from going to hell. Uh, you know, the, the <laughs> so spiritual true. people, I go, why am I paying them 10%? <laughs> I, can, I can create my own heaven, which I did. And all of a sudden it says, stop disempowering me. That is the message. Who does it go to? It goes to the medical community that you disempower me by telling me w what my future is going to be. And I buy into the belief in that first seven years that you control my health. I don't control my health. I'd go to the doctor. The, and my program is doctor knows about my health. I don't. The doctor says you're going to die in three months. Then guess what? <laughs> you just put in your brain a program of in three months, I will be dead, and you will. I say, will you die of the cancer they said you had? And I go, nope. You can you die from the belief of the three months because when I started doing autopsies on people that we know they were going to die in three months of this cancer, and they start finding it. They didn't die from the cancer. What did they die from? The belief. Belief controls your life. If you believe you're going to die, you can die just from the belief. A lack of knowledge is a lack of power. What you don't know disempowers you. And the idea, for example, that uh, the public has been programmed that you're victims uh, of genetics, and I say, well, so what does that mean? That makes you powerless. Because it comes to health, and all of a sudden you say, well, I can't do anything about it. My genes are doing this. And then you say, who can do something? And then you find a rescuer. And that rescuer will charge you to take care of that belief system that you bought into. So as, as long as you believe you're a victim, you will pay whatever money it costs to get out of being that victim. And no matter how much, I mean, uh, it was always amazing to me that uh, my brother had hep C. And then this pill comes out. He goes, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can cure hep C. I go, Yeah. It's like, well, what is it? I said, it's this pill. I say, it only costs a thousand dollars a pill. Yeah. How many do you need? 100 pills. I say, holy crap. A hundred thousand dollars. You know, we have the cure. Why am I charging a hundred thousand dollars? Because humanity doesn't exist. Darwinian theory exists. Darwinian theory says, if I can get it from you, I'm going to get it from you. And you scare people. Uh, uh, in my recent lectures, I've gotten a little into this effort of talking about, I call it the power mongers credo. Those that seek power, here's how you do it. You give them the poison for free, 
and then you charge them for the antidote. Mm. I go, that's the game from history on to the current moment. Uh, the, the church gave people hell, which they actually took from Greek mythology, and they gave it to them, and then when Dante put in pictures, and everybody goes, oh, my God, there's a hell. And, and then I say, and then what do they do? They say, well, for 10% of your salary, called tithing, we'll help you not go there. <laughs> well, they created the damn problem. Then they sold them the resolution. And I go, same thing with COVID. You're all going to die. But we have free vaccine. Free vaccine, you lying bastards. There was no ever such thing as Pfizer gave you the vaccine. Congratulations. Thank you, Pfizer. It was a billion dollars of our own money. That, and then they say free. It's like they wanted you to have it so bad because that's disempowerment. Uh, uh, and the idea is this is part of a game. Same game from history through. First scare the hell out of you and then tell you how you can avoid the problem. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight our favorite lessons from the video that will inspire you to remember what you learned today and actually apply them. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. 5% of the day we move toward wishes, desires, what we want. Even, you know, the addict is like, yeah, I don't want this. This is not my life. I really want this and, and all that. Uh, and then I say, yeah, but that only works 5% of the day. 95% of the day you're coming from the habit. Yeah, but the habit was other people's behavior that you put into the subconscious first. And so 95% of the day you're not operating from your wishes and desires. You're operating from a program. Sure. Okay. But now here's the catch and then we'll get, we'll get on to it. And sure. that is this. By definition, if I am thinking all of a sudden, I say, what am I doing next Wednesday? I go into my head and I'm thinking about what I'm doing, uh, what's on Wednesday. By definition, I'm not paying attention to what's going on. So that doesn't mean like you're walking down the street, you have a thought and then you freeze while the thought happens. And then after the thought, then you start walking back down the street again. No, if you're walking down the street and you have a thought, the moment you have a conscious mind engaged in thought, it, the functions are defaulted to the subconscious program. So in other words, I know how to walk. Uh, it's a habit. I learned that. So I don't need my conscious mind to tell me how to walk. So my conscious mind goes in thought. I'm still walking. So whatever behavior I'm doing, driving a car, <laughs> I, I don't have to pay attention to what's going on when I'm driving a car. I mean, uh, the, the joke when I lecture about it is I say, look, uh, you know, I've been in a car with a passenger. We get so engaged in a conversation. My conscious mind is tied up with the conversation. And then all of a sudden I look out the window of the car and it dawns on me. I haven't paid attention to the road for the last five minutes. Right. How did I get home? <laughs> yeah, and, and here's what the neat part is. Well, look, yes. driving is once you practice and learn how to drive, practice makes habit. Habit means that the subconscious mind doesn't need you to explain how to drive and what to watch out for. Subconscious mind's already got a program. 95% of our behavior is coming from sub below consciousness uh, and we're the ones that can't see it when we play it but everybody else of course is uh, seeing exactly what we're doing so the whole idea is are you living the life you want or are you living the life you've been programmed and the answer unfortunately is most of us are living the life we've been programmed and and the programming comes from other people so it's not our lives the reason let's give a reason why programming occurs okay uh, the brain is a computer most powerful computer that humans have ever experienced. But it has parallels to computers. And number one is this. Um, in the old days when you would buy a computer before they put the programs in, you could bring it home, brand new computer, plug it in, push start, boots up, screens on, and I say, do something. And people, well, no, I can't do anything. So you got a brand new computer. No. First, you have to put programs into a computer before you can use that computer. The brain of a, of a human is the same thing. Uh, the screen lights up in the last trimester of pregnancy. It's ready, 
but there are no programs. So the first seven years of a child's life is the brain is not operating at the higher level of consciousness, higher level, higher vibration. Now, that's what we talk about. We put wires on a person's head, electroencephalograph, read brain function. A child up through seven is not operating at consciousness except for a little bit. It's primarily operating at a lower vibration called theta. And I said, well, what is theta? I say, it's expressed as imagination. So that's how uh, children can have a tea party and they pour nothing into the cup and then they drink the nothing and then they explain how that was the best tea they ever had. Or a child rides a broom saying it's a horse. In the child's mind, that is not a broom, it's a, it's a horse. But it's mixing imagination and reality. But theta is hypnosis. And the significance of that is children have to learn how to become a member of a family, the rules. Member of a community, the rules. I go, how can an infant, a young kid, learn these rules? They can't go to school, they can't read the book and all that. And I say, you don't have to. Nature provided theta hypnosis so that they can observe the parents, the family, and the community. Just observe their behavior and download those as programs. Age seven, then that's when they start to become more conscious and engaging themselves. First seven years is programming, but after age seven, 95% of your life is coming from that program. So if you can program the child for the first seven years, then the rest of the life of that child is actually an expression of that program. I was given an opportunity to go to San Francisco and have a big presentation at a big conference on energy and crystals and stuff like that. And I thought, well, there's going to be an audience there, energy and crystals. Like, okay, this, everything I'm talking about in biology, man, I was so excited. And I thought, this is my great opportunity. And it was like like three months before, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'm going to work on this. And then it, I just let it go. I let it go. And now we're getting to a month before. And I said, oh, I got to work on my, what's my seminar going to be? What's my seminar? And all I had in my head was, okay, this was a new agey kind of thing. So I thought, well, back then, what the heck was new agey? I said, oh, that's where they wear all white, white shirts and white pants and a white vest, white clothes, you know, and that they're so delicate and they speak in a very quiet tone and they're so new agey. And that really wasn't me. I was like the bull in the china shop, you know, it's like, hey, let me and it goes, no, no, that's, no I got to calm down. I got to be cool. I'm going to present this in a new age fashion. So I tried to formulate a new age me to present this. Well, now it's about a week before this conference. And it's like my new age me has not come up with any idea of how to present this. And then it started to get closer. And it was just a few days away. I'm going to go to San Francisco. I was like, oh, my God, I don't have a talk. And I just said, forget it. Let me just be me. I just want to talk the way I want to talk. I'm not going to conform to be some new age guru. That's not me. I'm a science guy, and I'm going to say what I want to say. And finally, in that moment, it was just a couple of days before, and all of a sudden I said, that's it. No more new age. Let's, uh, let's write this. And the moment I let go of some persona I was supposed to be and just said, now, nah, I'm just going to be me, all of a sudden, the words started coming out. I can remember I grabbed a yellow pad and I had a pen, and the words started coming so fast. As soon as I said, stop being new age guy, start being Bruce, the words started coming page after page. I was right. I had like four or five pages of notes, 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 notes. Like after all those months, it was sort of like, okay, it was a little constipated in my consciousness, you know, but it all of a sudden freed up. And it's why I am not them. I'm me, <laughs> and try to act like somebody else took away everything I was. And that was at the point that said, oh my God, I'm gonna have, I'm not gonna alter who I am. I love this research. I'm not gonna tailor it for, <laughs> for that audience. And it was so wonderful because there were three months where it was just logging back in my head, back in my head. Yeah, I got to do this. I didn't do this. Like, didn't want to do it. Why? Because at some level, the first thing was, I'm going to be somebody else. I'm going to be Mr. New Age Guy. Ha! The moment I let go of being somebody else and became me, then all the words came down. Consciousness is creating your reality. If you put a picture of fear into your reality, then your biology behavior will manifest things to be afraid of. Because this is a, a short statement, but to me, it's the most powerful one. Simple and short. And it goes like this. The function of the mind 
is to create coherence between your beliefs and your reality. If I have a negative belief, the function of my mind is to manifest behavior to experience those negative realities. If I have positive beliefs, then the function of my mind is to manifest a positive experience. But we get programmed with so many negative beliefs, and that takes away our power because we're not focusing on the beautiful things. We're focusing on the fear. What are you afraid of? How effective is your conscious mind at overriding the subconscious? I say it works 5% of the time with a miniature computer. And I go, wow, that's your problem. I go, the only way you can override the program is not play the program. And that's when we said, stay mindful. And then then we then said, well, that's going to be difficult because we have to think. So there's only one way out. No, no, don't keep it a secret. Tell everybody. There's only one way out. Reprogram the subconscious mind. And I go, significance. If you would put wishes and desire programs into the subconscious mind, that means that that program would be operating 95% of the day. Meaning, whether your conscious mind is in control saying, these are my wishes and desires, or the conscious mind's thinking, then the subconscious mind comes in and says, these are my wishes and desires. Then guess what? Then 100% of your life, you're living wishes and desires. And therefore, all of a sudden, then the, 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 the work has to come back to each of us as individuals. Each of us got programmed. Each of us is manifesting that program. We give up our power in many of the programs. The fine example is you were sick as a kid. And just like your parents and any other family members, when you were sick, you went to the doctor. And I go, that's a habit. I said, what does it mean? It says, you learn this in the first seven years, the program. It says, when you're sick, you give up this power and you go to that doctor and you accept the doctor as the power of over you. Because when it came to health, it's like, no, no, you don't do it. The doctor does it. That's the program. I say, so what's the point? You have given up power over the control of your life and have given it to the truths, quote unquote, offered by the doctor. I go, significance. I go, the doctor misreads your diagnosis and then tells you, oh, I'm sorry, you only have three months left to live. And I go, significance. 95% of the day, the program says the doctor is the, you know, the correct one. The truth. What do I know? The doctor knows. What do I know? So 95% of the day, then your belief system is going to do what? Take the words of the doctor and manifest them as truth. I go, what's that mean? Well, you're going to die in about three months. I go, from what? I go, hey, that was a misdiagnosis. <laughs> you're still going to die because your belief system will manifest an illness that will terminate. Cancer, for example, is not due to any genes. There's no gene that causes cancer. The genes are correlated with cancer. And I go, well, what causes cancer? I say disharmony and repressed anger is one of the big ones. Mm-hmm. I go, so then I say the genes didn't cause it. I say no. So I said, then what caused it? I say, my consciousness. I say, what? Repressed anger, (laughs) you know? And I go, so what? I say, well, change consciousness. And guess what? You can go into remission. The cancer will go away as soon as you change the consciousness. (laughs) And all of a sudden, it's like, I thought I was a victim of the genes. I said, that's a program. And that is totally incorrect. Because as quantum physics says, consciousness is creating our life experiences. And as the new biology, which I'm familiar with, called epigenetics, is how consciousness controls the genetics. And all of a sudden I say, oh, well then biology and quantum physics now share the same story. Yeah, you're creating this. And the idea is then if you look at the creation and you're not happy with it, don't go out and blame the creation because you never saw that you were participating in a way invisible to you that led to this expression. If you wanna change it, you have to change you And then the environment will change. The fear, which is human specific, is the fear of mortality. There's no other organism that knows it's going to die. And I say that fear is what then we gave up our power to have somebody assuage that fear. It's like, oh, it's not so bad or whatever. You know, we we bought what? Religion. Why did we buy religion? Well, I'm going to tell you about what happens after you die, the big mystery. And I say, oh, 
Then all of a sudden, guess what? They made the program for my life. I go, who the hell are you to make a program for my life? Well, I bought it because I was in fear. And fear means I have no power. And when I have no power, I'm going to seek someone who says they have the power. And then I'm going to accommodate what they do. And so people join into religion because they have the fear of the afterlife. Well, I'm going to tell you the beautiful part about my research was I didn't believe in spirituality. Okay. I had no, to me, afterlife was, oh, I'm chemicals. And when I die, I go back into chemistry. You know, that's what it is. But when I understood this, I said, oh my God, I'm an immortal entity. I'm a spiritual field, quantum mechanics, a field. And all of a sudden I started to realize, oh my goodness, I, 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 I have no fear. Why? I'm not going to die. I'm not even in here. So how the hell am I going to die? And once that fear was gone, my life was radically different. I tell you why. Because we all live with that biological imperative that says, I'm afraid to die. <laughs> and I said, but what if you're not afraid to die? What if you don't see death as an end? What if you see it as just a transition into another way? And all of a sudden I said, what the consequence of that is? No fear. I said, then what does that mean? I said, then I'm more powerful because it was the fear that took away my power. And if I don't have fear, then you can't scare me. And I don't, I'm not scared. And I don't care about your rules about afterlife because I have my own understanding now. You don't have to try and tell me about afterlife. I know what I am. I'm a spirit. I'm an energy field. There are three ways to change belief, okay? Self-hypnosis, earphones on at night. Repetition, create a new habit. And third one, energy psychology, which allows you to rewrite an existing program in minutes. Uh, and we need to do this. Why? Because if you haven't noticed and you haven't looked out the window, the world's falling apart. <laughs> I go, and why is it falling apart? And the answer is because we're facing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life. The web of life is collapsing. I go, then why is the web of life collapsing? The answer is human behavior. I go, oh. You don't want the web to collapse? We have to change the behavior. And this is what the world is experiencing at this time. The chaos all over the world is bringing to light the fact that these behaviors we're fighting and violently with are behaviors that have taken us out of heaven and put our consciousness into a world that we're experiencing, which is falling apart. You want to make a world of heaven? Then you change the program and then you could have heaven. It's your belief system that, that creates this. You fell in love because you stopped playing your program and you created heaven. I say, well, guess what? Heaven was always there, except the damn program got in the way. So you want heaven on earth? Don't play the program, stay mindful, or B, rewrite the existing program and put heaven on earth programs in there, and then 95% of the day you'll be playing that. Your life, 95%, is coming from the program. Your life is a printout of your programs. You just look at your life and recognize simple fact, the things that you like that come into your life, they come in because you have a program to acknowledge those things. But the things you wish, desire, want in your life, and you work hard to make them happen, you struggle, you sweat over it. I'm putting a lot of effort in, I'm gonna make this happen. Why are you working so hard? And the answer, is whatever that destination is, <clears throat> your program doesn't support it. And you're trying to use your conscious creative mind to override the program. I say, yeah, but conscious mind is 5%, program is 95%. I go, it's not going to work <laughs> very so, well at all. So that's why poor people stay poor and rich people stay rich. Yep, that's why the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that was exactly what the whole point was. If you grow up with the programming of a rich family, you don't have to think. Programming is subconscious. Your thinking might be quite stupid. I mean, a former president of ours was a relatively rich person, but not very smart in his conscious mind. But his program was how do I got how I got rich by what he downloaded that from his family. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. and if you're in a poor family, what did you download? Oh, life's a struggle. It's not. I can't get there. As yeah. you know, you can change it. Mm -hmm. I say, yeah. How can you change it? Remember, I said, well, there are two minds. Conscious is creative wishes and desires, subconscious hard drive with a program. I say, the conscious mind being creative can learn from anything. Read a self-help book. Oh, yeah, I know how to do that. I say, you read the book. I give you a quiz. You get 100. And it says, yeah, you know this stuff. And then I say, well, now that you know this stuff, did your life change? And the answer is no. I go, why? 
the conscious mind learned from reading the book. That's not how the subconscious mind learns. So our smarts stay up here. I read the book. I knew the information. I understood how it worked, blah, 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 blah. I go, yeah, that's the thinking mind. That knows. But I go, does that translate into subconscious? I go, no, it doesn't, because that's not how the subconscious mind learns. You want to change the subconscious, then you have to put in the data the way the subconscious mind learns. Conscious mind creative can learn from anything. You can just go, aha, I just changed my mind. I can do that, okay? Subconscious mind, habit. Point of habit, it resists change. If a habit changes, then by definition, it's not a habit anymore. So habits resist change, and yet we have these habits. And we want to change them. And I say, well, how can you do it? And I say, the only way you can change the habits is the way that the habits were learned in the first place. I go, well, what was that? And I said, first seven years, your brain was at a lower vibration than consciousness. It was called theta. Theta is hypnosis. And I go, oh, so what do I do? And I say, well, you, you can't just say, okay, I want to go into hypnosis. Hypnosis is part of a scale of low vibration going to high during the day. And then when you come home from work, the high vibration slows down and goes to sleep at the lowest vibration. So you go through a range of different vibrations as you're sleeping, awakening, calm, conscious, focus, conscious. You're at work, focus, conscious. And I go, then what? You come home, you calm down. Now it's calm, conscious. And then I say, what? Then you fall asleep. And I say, the instant you fall asleep, the next vibration down is theta. I go, that's hypnosis. I go, yeah. So I say, then every night, the moment you fall asleep, the brain for a short period of time is in hypnosis theta. So I say, so what? Well, you put on uh, earphones or earplugs and you go to bed playing a program that you want to be true in your life. I say, so what? And I say, you put it on just before you fall asleep. And while you're still awake, you probably hear some of the program, okay? But the moment you fall asleep, conscious mind's disconnected, doesn't hear anything coming off of the program anymore. I say, but what does? I say, ah, the subconscious mind is in theta, record. So whatever's coming through the earphones is not going into conscious mind, but it's now being directly downloaded into the subconscious. So this is called self-hypnosis. You have to repeat this process because the amount of time in theta is relatively short before, before you hit the lowest vibration, delta, which is sleep outright, okay? So every night when you go to bed, just after your consciousness falls asleep, there's a period of record opportunity. And then we put the earphones on, play the program. It's called self-hypnosis. That's hypnosis. You're doing it yourself, okay? Number two, you still learn programs after age seven. You learn how to drive a car. Mm -hmm. learn how to play an instrument. I go, well, how'd you do it that way? And I go, repetition. Habituation is practicing something and repeating it and repeating it so many times that the subconscious finally says, okay, I got a pattern. I got the pattern. And that pattern then becomes the habit. Negative thinking is equally powerful, but works in the opposite direction. Meaning with positive thinking, you could heal yourself of any disease. With negative thinking, you can die and create any disease. You can create your own death just because you believe you're going to die. And all of a sudden I say, well, then it's the power of belief, positive or negative, that is shaping the world. And I go, well, this is why when we look at people's beliefs and, and they, they do a you know an assessment of, they find out over 60% of the beliefs that we're manifesting every day are negative and disempowering, self-sabotaging thoughts that we've acquired, such as, I'm a victim of my genes. That's a belief. <laughs> and somebody says, yeah, well, I'm going to die of cancer because it's running in my, in my family and they get cancer and then they find out there's no gene that causes cancer. Oh, I'm, I'm saying this on uh, on Lynn's show. I will have to emphasize that there is not one gene that if you have this gene, you have cancer. Genes are correlated with cancer. Genes are not causing cancer. This is why half the women that have the breast cancer gene, BRCA2, half the women never get the cancer, but they all possess a gene. So where's the point? I said, the gene didn't cause it. It was a lifestyle that was not in harmony, that ultimately activated what is called a cancer gene. I said, so what do you mean? So if you change your thoughts, you can get rid of cancer? I go, yeah, well, that's what spontaneous remission is all about. Uh, and so uh, I'm stepping on Linsfield here because this is where this emanation of thought 
and we don't see it and we don't uh, in our history or oh that's just thoughts and feelings i go <laughs> those are the controls that are manifesting your life your thoughts and your feelings your feelings are the translation of the energy into sensation so your feelings are like a compass they're telling you whether <laughs> you're going toward more life or to less life the most important aspect about sleep is that it gives a chance for the body to recalibrate its system. So when consciousness is out, then uh, the body starts to balance everything that's going on, uh, you know, with each system, the body's pH, the temperature regulation. Very interesting point that when people are comatose uh, and they're in a hospital and they got all the wires on them and everything, they run at a beautiful, just just beautiful, like idling speed. They're comatose, but their body is maintained a balance and harmony and everything is great in the body level. But as soon as they become awake, then the parameters in the body all start to change because it's our consciousness that is creating the, the, the functions of our body. Uh, and it's really important for people to understand this is that Quantum physics is the most valid science on this planet in regard to its theoretical insights. Um, and the number one principle in quantum physics is consciousness is creating our life experience. That's the most important understanding. Because it says we're not just a, a machine, but we're like a remote control machine. There's a, uh, an energy field that is being picked up by each of us that is different. Uh, the, the field that's being received is different for each person. The conscious mind is the latest evolution of the brain right behind your forehead. It's the one connected to your personal identity, your spirituality. No two people share that. That's the one with the self receptors. Okay. The subconscious mind, the bigger part of the brain was there before consciousness, subconscious, meaning below consciousness. It operates without you even seeing it, it's like the computer doing stuff in the background where you're working on something is doing something in the background. The subconscious is not creative. The conscious is creative. The subconscious is habitual, programmed. Mm -hmm. And that program runs. I said, when does it run? And I say, well, there's background stuff. Look at your body temperature is maintaining itself. Your physiology is running. Your kidneys are going. You don't have to sit here and think about that but it also controls behavior. I say, so wait a minute, when does it control behavior? This, finally Lipton gets to the point. Uh, this is the point. The conscious mind, which is creative, has the wishes and desires. You ask anybody, what do you want? The answer comes from the creative conscious mind, okay? The conscious mind can do two things, and this is where the problem, boom, the whole problem of the planet right now. I say, what is it? The conscious mind can look out the eyes, like imagine your body is a vehicle and you're looking out the windshield and the conscious mind is driving uh, and the conscious mind is taking you to where? Wherever you want to go, it's wishes and desires. I go, great. But then I say, what else can the conscious mind do? And this is the problem. I say, what is it? It can think. I go, so hmm. where's the problem? Thinking is not looking out. Thinking is looking in. So the moment you are thinking, your conscious mind is not paying attention to the outer world. The moment you are thinking, you're inside and say, yeah, but what if you're driving the car and you start thinking? I go, this is the cool part. This is when you start thinking, the subconscious is autopilot. You mm -hmm. train to drive the car so the Oh, the subconscious got a program to drive the car, play a music and ride a bike, walk down the street, do your job. Habits become programs. You don't have to think about them. So I go, so what's the point? How much time does the average person spend thinking? 95% of the day. I go, but what does that translate to? 5% of the day you're paying attention to the world and creating by looking out your windshield where I want to go, and what I want, this is what my life, I want that 5%. 95% of the day when your conscious mind is thinking, subconscious programs are autopilot. They step in, take over. I go, so? You don't see them. <laughs> what do you mean I don't see these behaviors? 
because you're not paying attention, you're looking inside. So whatever behavior your program is, you are playing it and you're the only one who can't see the damn program. One of the things that really upset me for a long time was the fact that I had great ideas and intentions and I wanted to manifest them and I thought this is how it's going to manifest and so I had all these visions of how things were going to unfold. And then I'd start a process and it wouldn't unfold and then it would irritate me because it's like, I've got to make it work, i got to make it work. Uh, ultimately, I started to recognize when things didn't work, it was possibly because there were better ways to do it and I wasn't conscious of it. And so what I started to learn over a period of time was simply this. There, there's an old saying, there's a means to an end. Uh, and the idea, well, the end is your destination. And of course, the means are how you're going to get to that destination. Well, of course, all of us sit down and say, yeah, this is what I want. And then we start to figure out, well, this is what I'll do to get to those ends. I'll get to this and I'll get to this to get to the end. What I started to realize at some point was maybe my awareness of how to get to the end wasn't exactly accurate. And it turns out many of the times when things didn't work, and I was like so upset it didn't work, but it turned out, oh, there was a better way to get there and I didn't even know it. So the universe was really facilitating me uh, and I wasn't paying attention. I was getting angry at the universe because like it's not working the way I want it to work. And then I started to realize at some point was, my God, maybe the universe has a better <laughs> solution than the one I was even thinking of myself. So I really learned over a period of time, it's very critical insight to help me get to where I am is to focus on the, on the end. What is it I really want? Put that focus together, and it's very critical. It's very interesting because a lot of people have, well, I would like this, and it's a broad, general category, and then at some point, it's, like, well, it's not specific enough. <laughs> you have to actually say what it is you want. Uh, I'll always remember I was uh, uh, looking for a special shirt to go to a Pink Floyd concert. And, and I just all of a sudden visualized, oh, it'd be neat to have a Russian shirt, you know, with a collar that goes across here and a couple of buttons down. And I thought, oh yeah, that would be really great. That would be a cool shirt. And then I stopped and I was thinking, where the heck do you get a shirt like that? I have no idea in the world. But I thought that would be pretty good. So I figure, well, I still got to get something. So I drive off to a mall up near San Francisco and I walk into the mall and there's a first men's store over there. And I go, let's start looking. I have no idea. And I walk in and of course, there's this big circular rack of sale clothes. And I thought, what the hell? It's only a Pink Floyd concert one night. Let's see what's in there. And I started going through the rack and lo and behold, oh my God, a Russian shirt right in the middle of everything. And it was like the shock of, oh my God, there's a Russian shirt right here. The, infor the unfortunate part of it <laughs> was I had the picture of a Russian shirt. I said, cool. I never said what the color was or anything else. I just said Russian shirt. And there was a Russian shirt. Color? Gray. No color at all. Why? I didn't put in the concept of color. And the universe said, well, just give it to them in gray. Uh, and it was one of those things like, oh, be conscious of what you're asking for because the, the more detail you put in, the more the universe can manifest a resolution. If you leave a lot of blanks in what you want, then all of a sudden it's like, well, it's random, whatever fills in the blank because you never said what you wanted. You can have an idea of what you want, and that's important. But the most important part of that, just having an idea, is not just have a broad idea, I want X, and I go, no, no, what exactly do you want, Why? Go back to the principles of science, and the principles of science reveal something very important. That principle of science is this. Consciousness is creating our life experiences. I go, well, that sounds new agey. I go, no, this is not new agey. This is the primary principle of quantum physics. We are creators. This is a fact. In fact, uh, quantum physics says that, but now let me add one other fact. Epigenetics says the same thing, because epigenetics says your consciousness is controlling your behavior and your genes. And so it's time to stop for a second and recognize, where is your consciousness? What are you thinking about? And the idea is, start thinking all those very positive thoughts, but don't try and tell the universe how it's gonna manifest, okay? You think of the picture, let the universe get you there. And that's the most important lesson I've learned. I'm not telling the universe how I'm gonna get there. I'm just saying, universe, this is where I want to go. And then the universe will take care of it. 
It's so powerful. It's so wonderful. And I never believed in it for the first 40, 50 years of my life. But I can tell you now, the life that I'm manifesting today is a consequence of just what I said. Focus on the end. Don't tell the universe the means to get there. What are some daily affirmations you started to implement when you saw this depressed thoughts coming in or these self-sabotage thoughts coming in? How, what did you shift it with affirmations, with different thoughts? What did you start to say? It was just the awareness, A, that, you know, as I said, the very first stop light where I started all of a sudden listen while I'm waiting for the light. It was like the first time I tuned in and go, what the hell are you thinking? That was the most important thing. Because then the habit of not going there anymore, starting to realize, uh oh, this is why am I thinking this negative thing? Turn around, make a positive statement right now, because that negative one is taking you on the, and just a repetition of this behavior become habitual. So, and habits are great. Why? No effort. I love habits. Why? You don't even have to think about them, they do it automatically, you know? So, if you put in these really great habits, you can walk through the day and Think anything you want, do anything you want, and your habit, if they're good ones, will just guide you perfectly through here without even being involved with thinking. Um, ah, that's the game. The game is what is heaven to you? Then program that that's your life. And then guess what? The 95% of the day manifesting heaven where well, you're not even thinking about it. Once you have identified your programs, how can you change or what do you do with them? Um, <laughs> That always comes up because that's the most important question. After you understand how it works, the most important question is, well, how long do I change the program? <laughs> and I go, this is the critical part. The conscious mind is creative, which means it can think of anything. The subconscious mind is programmed. It's got habits. I go, so what? And I say, habits, when you have them, it's a habit. You do not want to change a habit, which is important. You learned how to walk before you were two. I'm glad you don't change your habit because you'll forget how to walk. I say, nope, same program you learned before two can carry you 100 years, same program, okay? Habits do not want to change because if a habit changes, then by definition, it's not a habit. <laughs> so the subconscious mind is habit mind. I say, yeah, but how do I change it? I say, there's three ways only that you can control this. Number one. How'd you get the habits in the first place? I say for seven years, my brain was at a low vibration called theta, which is just below consciousness. And theta is the direct hypnosis line to the subconscious. So when you're in theta, whatever you're experiencing at that point can be downloaded straight into the subconscious. I say, well, how do you get the theta? I say, Interesting. Every day when you're up at work, you got a high vibration in the in the brain. That's again with the wires on your head, EEG. The high vibration is called beta. That's like schoolroom studying, focused consciousness. When you come home and relax, the vibration goes lower. Now it goes into what is called alpha. Alpha is calm, relaxed consciousness. But when you get really calm and you're really relaxed, guess what? Alpha shuts off, you're sleeping. When, you're, when alpha is off, you are sleeping. But for the next period of time, right after you fell asleep, the brain is operating in theta, and then it goes to the lowest vibration, deep sleep delta. So theta is a period when your mind goes to sleep, it's open for a little while, and theta is hypnosis. So if you put earphones on, and you play a program at night when you go to bed. Every night you go to bed, just before you fall asleep, you put the earphones on, you play a program of, a program about health, a program how to make money, a program how to be, you know, uh, relationships, self-help program, okay? At night, you put the earphones on when you go to bed. And as soon as you fall asleep, you're not awake anymore. Alpha, close, you're in theta, record, whatever's coming in through the earphones is not going into the conscious mind, it's going deeper into the subconscious. It's called self-hypnosis. You, you put the earphones on, you repeat that. Because theta is not a long period after you fall asleep, but if you repeat it every night, you'll get information into the subconscious. So number one, self-hypnosis, earphones out at night, play a program that you want to be true. 
Okay, and that will automatically happen. This is a demonstration that, and it's fun. Why? You were sleeping. You didn't even have to do any work. You just had to go to sleep and the work would be automatic. So when you wake up after playing this at night, uh, the subconscious will have a new program. And one day you wake up and you're living the new program without even playing the tapes anymore. It's once it's in, it's in. Okay. So number one is hypnosis, self-hypnosis. Okay. But after age seven, the brain is not in hypnosis. Uh, and now consciousness is working. I said, but you can still learn a program. You can learn a habit. And I say, how? Practice. Repetition. You want to drive a car? Well, I'm not getting in a car until you practice. Why? Because it's the practice that makes the program strong. The body provides us with sensations. Pain, love, joy, happiness, anger, <laughs> whatever. It comes from this mechanism. It's a mechanism. The the eyes take in light, but they don't they, they don't see light back here in the brain. They see energy vibrations. Sound comes in my ears. I don't hear the sound. I hear the vibrations. Taste. That's a vibration. It's a chemical vibration. And all of a sudden, oh my God, this is a transducer. It takes life experiences in a body that gives us vision and smell and taste and touch and pain and love and joy. And, and I say, and this is sent back to our source. So we came here to have life experiences. And I go, at that moment of awakening, I said, oh, crap. Here's a major difference between men and women. <laughs> men are not allowed to have these sensory experiences. And I'll give you a reason. But women are. So women are sensitive. They, and that's a way of life for them. They're sensitive. And then they go, but, but men are so insensitive. I go, that was a program. We were programmed to be insensitive for a very simple reason. You cannot be a soldier if you're sensitive. You can't kill somebody if you're sensitive. So men have been knowingly programmed to lose sensitivity so they can be used to do those jobs like killing somebody else. And I go, oh, my God. Then I missed the reason for being on this planet. I missed the feeling of what is love all about. You know, what are these senses of joy and happiness? I'm not allowed to experience them as a guy because uh, that interferes with a soldier job. <laughs> I go, I'm wasting my life. And that was a wake-up call. I said, well, damn it, go out and taste it and touch it and feel it and smell it and do whatever you want. And if it's really good, do it again. And if it didn't work out so good, then don't do that one again. You came here to have these experiences. Why would you want to waste your life having all the negative fear, anxiety, the, all those problems? It was a choice. It was consciousness. But we didn't know that because we were programmed to be victim. And a victim has no power. And as long as you believe you're a victim, then you manifest victim. Uh, uh, and this is why I'm so uh, honored to be with you, Jeff, because you're experiencing this. You know this stuff. You're trying to get this message out to the other people. Why? To wake us all up. Because we came here to manifest heaven on earth, like falling in love. And I go, then what about all this war and pestilence and plague and, and all these things? I go, oh, that's a manifestation. <laughs> and we're manifesting it. You can live in this world without even being involved with all those things. You just have to change who you are and what you are and what you want, conscious mind, versus programs, subconscious mind. And when you understand this, you become empowered. And I say, empowered to do what? I say, create heaven on earth. <laughs> and then people think, oh, you die and go to heaven. I go, boy, is that a big mistake? Because you're going to get to the pearly gates. St. Peter's going to be there. And he says, well, how was your experience in heaven? He said, what do you mean? I said, you were on earth, right? That's heaven. Why? That's where you came to create. What'd you create? I go, oh, I don't want to wait to the end, man. <laughs> uh, uh, my, my, my mother remarried when she was relatively older, and she married this guy who was, I said, curmudgeon guy. He was not a really happy guy or anything. He lived to be like 95, 96 or something. He had cancer. My mother took care of him at home. The last week of his life, he essentially wasn't there. He was just comatose, more or less, in the bed. And then two days before he died, he all of a sudden, his eyes opened up. He was there. And he looked at my mother and he said, 
I didn't have any fun. And all of a sudden, I just said, holy crap, he's going to die in two days. And he woke up today. <laughs> he didn't have any fun. I said, that's not me, babe. Because when I finish, it's going to be, that was great. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> the immune system protects you from a threat on the inside. Yeah. But if the tiger's chasing you, who cares about the threat on the inside? I go, I got a bacterial infection and a saber-toothed tiger chasing me. I think, where, where should I put my energy? And I, the hell with the infection. A tiger catches you. That infection's not a problem anymore. Yeah. So very important fact. Profoundly, everyone listen. Stress hormones specifically shut down the immune system mm -hmm. because the taking care of the inside is not as important as taking care of the whole thing running away. Uh, in fact, stress hormones are so good at this that when doctors want to transplant an organ from person A into person B, the recipient of that organ is given stress hormones before the operation because it reduces the function of the immune system, which would be rejecting the graft. And wow. so you don't want the immune system to reject a graft. So you give them stress hormones, which what? Shuts down the immune system. I go, well, guess what? In today's world, just watch the news for a moment, and all of a sudden, your immune system is going. Mm. Yeah. So that's number two. So number one, stress hormones shut down growth because feeding the viscera for its function is not worthy uh, of running away. I need to get the blood into the arms and legs. Uh, again, to conserve energy because, look, the immune system uses a lot of energy. If you've ever been sick, sometimes you don't have the energy to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, when it's operating, it could drain you of energy. Yeah, but if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, <laughs> the, the hell with the immune system. Uh, and, and so you shut that down. Mm -hmm. So those are two insults to the system. In other words, if I'm not under stress, I, I'm nourishing my body and I'm encouraging my immune system. And I'm staying healthy. But the moment I'm under stress, both of those things shut down and I'm ready to, to fight or flight. Uh, and then I, I said, well, there's a third one. I call that adding insult to injury. And the answer about what that means is this. The brain has the forebrain where conscious thinking is, conscious thinking, and the hindbrain, which is uh, like habit and reflex behavior. Mm -hmm. Conscious thinking is slow. I mean, uh, imagine your car is going out of control and it's spinning. And I say, stay in the conscious mind. It's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I say, yeah, but the moment the car starts to go out of control, the stress hormones go in. Remember I told you they squeeze the blood vessels in the gut? They mm. squeeze the blood vessels in the forebrain. I say, why? Because it pushes the blood to the hindbrain, which is a million times more powerful than the forebrain as a machine processor. And I go, so why is it relevant? I go, because the moment the car is going out of control, it's, oh, well, <laughs> turning the wheel, hitting the pedals, you're doing everything beyond fast, so fast, okay? Yes. So when you're in a stressful situation, thinking is slow. And therefore, the system doesn't want you to be slow. It needs you to go, boom, react, reflect right away. So the blood vessels from the same chemistry, squeezing the blood vessels down the gut, squeeze the blood vessels here, push it to the hindbrain, we become less intelligent mm. when we're under stress because now we're reactive. And it gets to a point that sometimes you're so afraid that you take care of me. <laughs> and then we give up, we give up control to the guy with the bigger stick. Yes. <laughs> yes. You take care of me. Well, that means we're a victim. Yeah. Victim means we're powerless. I go, when stress hormones are in the system, the only power you have is to run. Mm -hmm. And I go, and the relevance about that is very, is very simple. And, and that is that it was only designed with saber-toothed tigers in mind. I go, why is that relevant? I said, well, a saber-toothed tiger is chasing you. I go, yeah, and I'm running like crazy. I got blood in my arms and legs. I got all the energy. And I say, yeah, but if you escape that tiger in a few minutes of running, then there's no more threat. And then all of a sudden, the stress hormones are gone, and then you're back into growth and everything else. But today, mm -hmm. stress is 24-7, 365. A human body was never designed to be maintaining a stress situation because it suppresses the vitality of the system. And in today's world with the idea of COVID, everyone's afraid. <laughs> I go, and guess what? The one thing you wanted was your immune system to work. And the one thing that's not working because you're afraid is the immune system. I go, the more fear people have, 
the sicker they become. Yes. And this is a wake up call that says, man, we have to stop listening to that fear drum. They keep beating the drum. Every, oh, everybody's going to die. I go, no, somebody <laughs> going to die. You know, there are people who are indeed vulnerable because they're already stressed immune system. People that live in stress are already uh, open to a problem. Uh, older people whose immune system is, uh, are not working up to the fullest capability, they're under threat because their immune system is already compromised. And then there's the people with what are called comorbidities. I go, what are they? I say, these are stressors on the system that are chronic. Overweight is one of the biggest ones. Uh, in the serious cases of COVID, 78% of those serious patients were overweight. Why? Overweight is a challenge to the system, and you're already challenging your immune system before the damn virus showed up. So that's a big problem. Uh, diabetes type 2, meaning that's a stress world. Diabetes is a stressor that's in the system. The more stressors that you have going, the less effective your immune system is. So it turns out, here's a number, unfortunately, Americans, 60% uh, of Americans have at least one comorbidity. They're slightly compromised, okay? Uh -huh. But 40%, and this is where the issue comes from, have two or more simultaneous mm -hmm. comorbidities. These are people that are ripe for infection. Why? Mm -hmm. Their immune systems are already compromised before the damn virus showed up. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, then I'm a, am I afraid of COVID? I said, well, if you're a healthy person, no. <laughs> If you're, you know, if you're a compromised person, then you should be taking care of yourself. Mm. I don't have to take care of myself. You mm. have to take care of yourself because you're the one that's open. And yet we want everybody to put on the mask and everybody to get the vaccines. I go, that the, that's stuff. I was going to say a bad word. That stuff <laughs> is not valid. I go, what do you mean it's not valid? I say, uh, the, the country of Gibraltar, 100% of that population has been vaccinated. And guess what? Delta went through there like a plague, man. And I say, yeah, but they were all vaccinated. I go, yeah, because the vaccine doesn't work. I go, well, yeah, but now Omicron. I go, no, the vaccine doesn't work. And they say, well, get your booster shot. I say, get the booster shot. It didn't even work the damn first time. Why should it take the second time? It does not work. And, and so the real issue is this. We have to take care of our health uh, uh, and not wait for other people to protect me from them. Mm. Uh, if I'm a vulnerable person, it's my responsibility to take care of my health. Mind controls not just what genes are being activated, but mind can alter the blueprint. I can make 3,000 different proteins from the same blueprint just based on how I see the world. So all of a sudden it says, wow, we are very powerful. We're the architects and we can create health. But we can also create disease because we're the creator of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now comes the, the, the big part. And that is this. To me, the most valid science on this planet is quantum physics. Quantum physics, uh, I say that because uh, back in 1927, when it was theoretical, they came up with a whole bunch of things, you know, Albert Einstein, Max Planck, Heisenberg. They came up with a theory of how everything worked. Well, it's nearly 100 years. And guess what? Almost all of their theories are totally accurate. So we have a deep, deep understanding of quantum physics. Consciousness is creating our life experience. Principle number one. It was back in 1927. Max Planck, founder, one of the founders, said, the mind is the matrix of all matter. That's where the movie The Matrix comes from. Do you see value in going backwards? In other words, in psychotherapy or in going back to the past? No. And you say, well, why wouldn't I? Why didn't I see value in that? And I said, because when you go back and replay that problem, you've exercised that problem again. You have pushed the buttons that created the problem in the first place. That's why they have so many boxes of tissues in the in the psych office, because you're going to cry your eyes out. Why? Because you're going to be replaying the trauma of what caused the problem. And this is the cool part. It no longer exists. It's not there anymore, except for you carrying it with you. 
Mm. And there's a point where I say, well, then why should I go back and repeat this? Because it's just going to cause a replay of the same program, which reinforces that program. I go, I don't care about the past. I care about here I am today. I want to go this way. What do I want today? I don't care about what happened back there. Not that I should forget about it because I don't want to replay it again. But it doesn't control me anymore because I say replaying that is just, the you know, putting a, in the old days they had records you guys don't know about but they had <laughs> record uh, and if you keep playing the, record, the needle gets deeper in the, in the groove <laughs> i go we don't want to play it again so it's irrelevant to go back uh, i like it there's a, a story of a uh, two buddhist monks and uh, uh, monks are not the the male monks are not allowed to touch women and these two monks are walking along the path and they come to a river and there's a woman all dressed up in her wedding finery and she's crying and crying uh, and it's what's wrong? She says, "Well, I can't get across the water, and you know I'll ruin my clothes." And so one monk just picks her up, walks across, drops her on the other side, and then the two monks walk down the street. About half hour, forty five minutes later, the one that didn't pick her up turns to him and said, "You picked up a woman back there." <laughs> <laughs> and then the other monk says, "I put her down forty five minutes ago. You're still carrying her." <laughs> uh, and if you get the story, the story is this. It was over. The history is over. Do I want to repeat it? No. So there's a way of seeing what it was, but I don't have to repeat it because I have to say, what is it I want? Not what is it I don't want? A lot of people say, I don't want this. I go, yeah, but what is it you want? People have more problems answering what it is they want than saying what they don't want. Mm. And, uh, and the important part about this is you can only move into the future that you want by acknowledging what you want, not saying, I don't want that anymore. I said, well, that didn't, that oh. didn't give you your future. Uh, and, and so, yes, there are ways to reprogram the subconscious. Uh, and when you do, your life will change in permanently. As you understand the terms quantum physics and quantum mechanics or Newtonian physics and Newtonian mechanics, what you see is that physics and mechanics are synonyms. So physics really means the mechanisms by which the universe operates. And the new physics, quantum physics, was something that I really wasn't into, nor were any of my colleagues in the medical school. We were all trained in Newtonian physics. And the difference between the two is very profound. Newtonian physics says, the world that we live in, the universe we live in, is a, is a machine made out of mechanical parts. If you want to understand how it works, take it apart, study the pieces, change the pieces, change the operation. That's the basis of medicine. We look at a human body, it's a machine made out of physical parts. When it's not working right, change the parts by buying chemicals and drugs. Uh, and that's the way that conventional medicine operates. When I started to read the quantum physics, I realized, oh my goodness, the, the whole foundation of the universe is not based on a mechanical, physical universe. It's based on the invisible energy called the field. So uh, let's say if I hold a magnet right here in front of you, and you can see the magnet, but what you can't see is the invisible magnetic field. And, and so what it says is, well, we are physical things in our world like physical bodies. We're immersed in fields, electromagnetic uh, fields, magnetic fields itself, uh, all kinds of fields like telephone, uh, cell phone fields, uh, television fields, radio fields, whole ranges. What is the difference between the Newtonian physics and the qu and quantum physics is this. Newtonian physics focus on the particles. Quantum physics says, you want to understand why the particles take this shape? Then you have to understand the field. It's the field that controls biology. It's the invisible forces. There's a great quote by Albert Einstein, and it's, it's simple. It goes, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. In other words, in the world of invisible things, fields, and particles, matter, it's the field that gives shape to the matter. And this is the basis of quantum physics. This becomes relevant. It says, okay, here's the physical particles of my body. Why are they in a healthy state or why could they be in a sick state? That's the physical expression. And the answer is, well, to understand that, don't look at the body. You have to understand the invisible forces in the field. Uh, it, 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 and it's fun because if you think about it, when, 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 of course, when, when you were young, at some point you must have had like iron filings and sprinkled it around a magnet, and all of a sudden you saw the iron filings form that pattern of the magnetic field. Well, quantum physics would look at this pattern 
and try to explain how come all the iron filings fell in this pattern without recognizing that the field exists. In other words, can you explain why the iron filings have this shape if you don't recognize the magnetic field? And the answer is absolutely not. What's the nature of it? The body and its cells are like iron filings. Medicine is trying to understand the nature of the body by looking at the iron filings. And quantum physics says, if you don't understand that invisible field, you can't ever understand what's happening in the body. I need to empower the people because they have been invisibly disempowered without the knowledge that their life is coming from programs that they didn't even put in there. Right. <laughs> so sure. And, and these programs rarely support what you want. So you play the programs and all you find is you're not getting what you want. Those programs never gave it to you. Mm. You know, a, a famous book, uh, Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. This is truth. Here it is simple truth. If you grew up in a rich family, you were programmed how to be rich and how to have money. If you grew up in a poor family, you were programmed to recognize you don't have any money and you don't have any power. And I say that a rich person will stay rich. Why? Because 95% of their life is coming from the programs they downloaded from the rich parents who made all the money. The poor person is going to stay poor because 95% of their program comes from the poverty mentality that their family experienced when they were young. And all of a sudden it says, well, then you got programmed. You want to be a rich kid or a poor kid? I said, well, what the hell was your program? Right. Uh, and the big one that we're talking about, David, is the program of fear. Because we've all been programmed with some vision that other people have told us about the afterlife. The fear, the hell, the damnation. Oh, I don't want to die. I go, <laughs> hey. <laughs> From what are called near-death experiences where people have died for a period of time. Almost every one of them said the exact same thing. It was better out there than it was back here again. And, uh, you know, because a lot of them, when having this experience, are given a choice. Do you want to stay here in the afterlife or do you want to go back? And most of them would prefer to have stayed there, but have obligations and came back. Right. But the point was, yeah, you're not this physical body, you're the broadcast, you're the energy. But when you're playing through this body, then you're the experiences of your life at this point. When you're out of body, you are the energy. And the energy is forever. People don't realize the power of programming. I'll give you one right now. Cancer is one of the leading causes of death in, in, in the world right now. And I go, but what? And I go, there's no gene that causes cancer. What? Oh, well, they're oncogenes. We call these cancer genes, like the breast cancer gene. I go, those are genes associated with the cancer. They don't cause the cancer. For you know, example, so many women live in fear of the breast cancer gene because so many have it. But they live, what's the fear? I'm going to get the cancer. I have the gene. And I said, that fear is a vision which is manifesting into their reality. But then I go, you know, 50% of the women that carry the gene never get the cancer. I said, what's the point? And the point is this. Possession of the gene didn't cause cancer. It was a lifestyle that was undermining your biology that activated expression of these genes. The gene didn't activate itself. So all of a sudden it says, oh my goodness, then the idea of cancer didn't come from the genes. I go, no, it came from the programming. Programming of disharmony, dysfunction, not living in life, the fears that are programmed because our consciousness is creating this world. Oh, that's quantum physics. Oh, yeah, that's epigenetics. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely right. That's placebo. I go, what do you mean? I'm sick. And the doctor says, this is the greatest, newest research pill ever. It's going to cure you. You take the pill, you get better. And you go, oh, yeah, that was great. And then you find out the pill was a sugar pill. There's a very important point. Then what the hell healed you? Right. The conscious belief that you would be healed manifested healing. And I go, oh yeah, placebo. My thoughts manifested my reality. I go, that's exactly what it's all about. And yet, uh, while well, we are in a discussion of placebo, what people don't discuss, which is much more important to understand, is while well, positive thinking can heal us. Negative thinking is equally powerful in controlling the character of our lives so that negative thinking can cause any disease, even death. If you just believe you're going to die, you can die just from the belief of it. Wow. 
looking at the world and seeing what's going on right now, all the chaos, the upheaval that's going on is so distressing at one level. And it's interesting for me because as a scientist, I can stand up and talk about the fact that today's chaos is a necessary requirement for the evolution that we would love to see. And yet I, like you, have to live in this crazy world. It's mind blowing, it's crazy. And it becomes really important because all of this stuff that we're hearing is motivating fear. And fear, by its definition, is disempowering. Because when you're in fear, you're expressing, I have no power to take care of myself. And we give up power. And we give it up to other people to create the world for us. And obviously, by looking at this computer and watching what's going on around the world, those so-called leaders are not really helping us get to the destination of a heaven on earth reality. And it's time to recognize, yes, fear takes away our power. I've talked about that in many, many lectures, talked about the fact that stress hormones actually shut down our consciousness and puts us into a reactive mode. Well, this is not a time for reaction. This is a time for creation. And this is what the emphasis of quantum physics has been telling us, that it's our consciousness that is making creation. And yet, if we're living in fear, and consciousness is coming from fear, then what world are we creating? Well, that's the chaos we observe every day on the news. So in this situation, what we really have to do is just listen to the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt when he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Also relevant today are the profound words by Frank Herbert in Dune, where he says, fear is the mind killer. And this is what we have to recognize. Well, I've been talking about the fact that consciousness has created our world, and I say it's based on science. Well, let me give you a very important fact. It was in 1927, in the founding of the science of quantum physics, that we get the most important insight from one of the founding fathers of quantum physics, Max Planck. And what does Max say? All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind that force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. He concludes, this mind is the matrix of all matter. Well, that was, what, 70 some more years ago, 100 years ago? I say, has that changed? I go, no. Uh, look at this, for example. This is an article out of the most prestigious scientific journal on this planet, Nature. And I say, well, what's this article? I say, it's called The Mental Universe. It's by a quantum physicist at Johns Hopkins University. I'm not going to go and describe everything he says in the article because Richard Kahn Henry, the author, summed it up in the last sentence. Let me emphasize for you that last sentence in this article on quantum physics. The universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. When you think about someone who's an artist and they're creating a musician, a chef, um, a chef, a chef or, or in love, like you're in the flow, right? So you're yeah, just because you're, you're, you're not thinking. Yeah. You're not thinking you're doing, and it doesn't mean there's not participation. It just means that you're not thinking of the future. You're kind of just well, yeah, it's time and space was. sort of change. Like you lose track of time, yes. like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not thinking means not diverting to the subconscious, meaning you stay in conscious creativity. Yeah. Conscious creativity is wishes and desires. So a chef uh, is so involved with the cooking and paying attention to all the details, they're not thinking. And I say, well, what does that mean? They're not coming from program. They're coming mm -hmm. from creativity. Okay? The artist, the chef, uh, the race car driver. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Well, not thinking, man. Uh, you know, we're in it. <clears throat> we're going. I had a monk tell me I should write a book called The Speed of Consciousness. Well, that, that's it. Uh, and the subconscious is much faster than the conscious. And that's why in times of emergency, the conscious is too slow to help us. And that's why we jump to it. But then the problem is whatever behavior you're going to express while you're in that subconscious was a program that you had, a positive or a negative. Well, up to 60% of the programs that you downloaded are not positive. They're disempowered oh. programs. And in today's world, we're told, don't go by the feelings. If I did, I would have probably been better off at this moment. So when we recognize we have to make a decision, we can do it in two fundamental ways. First, 
do an assessment, an analysis of step by step, what does this decision mean and why should I choose it? But when you get to the end, before you absolutely take that information and make a decision based on that, ask your heart. And the reason why is this, the heart doesn't care about the individual steps in the decision. The heart only looks at the conclusion. Either you get more energy from this decision, a good vibe, a feeling that this is right, or the heart will give you a feeling of bad vibes, less energy, a feeling that maybe this isn't the right answer. So the significance is really profound because the heart just reads energy. And higher energy is more life, less energy is less life. So in making a decision, yes, it's acceptable to do the analysis, but before you come to that final decision, please check in with your heart. Feel the feelings. If the feelings are good, that means go toward that direction. But if you feel questioned about it, you feel weaker about it, it doesn't just feel right, the heart is telling you right off that that energy is not good for you and you should use some other decision. Oh, wow, that's so wonderful. What a wonderful way to make a decision based on these feelings. And they can help us find the direction that we need to go in and lead us to a better life. Uh-oh. I guess that's not really working for me at this moment. Whoops. Oh, well. Computer and simulation. Scotty, how many times have I told you not to leave me off at sea? You know I can't swim. Meet me at the bridge. You have some explaining to do. What do you mean by being able to change inner evolution? Because we all really do believe that genes are destiny. Well, the biggest story comes down to knowledge is power. And everyone goes, yeah, we all know knowledge is power. But let me put it in a better way for us now. A lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And a misperception, by definition, is a lack of knowledge. And now I have to say, we have been for the last 50 years operating under two very uh, important misperceptions. A, the one you brought up, genes control our life. This is totally false. Uh, and the second one is actually uh, the idea of a Newtonian universe that's split into physical matter and invisible energy and two different realms and they don't communicate and whatever's physical should be, you know, interfered with by something that's physical. So that's why we have pharmaceutical drugs. For, we have a physical body. You want to fix it. You have to give it something physical. So those are the drugs. And that's an outdated and disempowering illusion because it turns out it's energy and consciousness that shape the world. And 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 let me just emphasize it so it's not so it's so weird sounding. Yeah, it's consciousness. Our mind is creating this. Well, quantum physics is to me the most valid science on the planet. Uh, it, even before it was fully understood, the theoretical ideas that were presented have all been actually uh, realized that uh, the, that this is such an amazing science, quantum physics. And I say, so what's relevant about this valid science? I go, the first principle in quantum physics is consciousness is creating our life experiences. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, oh, that's so new age. I go, no, that's about as hardcore science as there is. And, uh, this consciousness, uh, and, and this is why I love working with you, Lynn, because your job has been raising consciousness around the world. Uh, and that is how we're going to evolve is, uh, not physically evolve, but we're going to evolve with consciousness. And so, uh, the knowledge, uh, that you're providing for people is empowering. And I like to do the same. The stress hormones shut off the immune system. Okay, so that's two problems right away. Growth maintenance, shut off by blood vessel squeezing, shut. Immune system, stress hormones directly inhibit the immune system, so I'm not putting energy in to internal problem when I'm being chased. And then I, I always call the third one the insult to the injury. You just injured your body. Now you will know what the insult is. I told you the stress hormones in the in the gut squeeze shut when you're in fear. That's a butterflies in the stomach. You can feel it. It's just queasy, queasy. And I go, what else? 
the stress hormones shut the blood vessels off in the thinking brain back right here, the, the prefrontal cortex. And when the blood is squeezed, the blood vessels are squeezed shut here, the blood is pushed to the hind brain. That's where reflexes occur and reactions occur. No thinking. So guess what? Under stress, you shut down thinking and now you're just reacting. And I go, so you lost the power of your consciousness. It's not working. What are the main limiting beliefs that you just hear consistently that most people tend to have if they're not in a heavy, uh, uh, higher level program that they've caught and switched with? Well, one of the main beliefs that they're caught up in is the uh, lack of power they feel over their own health and their own reality. That I'm a victim. I'm a victim of my genes. I'm a victim of this world out here. I say, if you, if a, <laughs> the belief system uh, is translated into behavior, <laughs> If I believe I'm a victim, then my behavior will be as a victim. No power. You guys tell me what to do, and I'll try and do what you just said. And I say, well, that's the biggest problem of all, because quantum physics, I mentioned, is the most valid science. And principle number one is you're the creator of this. And it's like, well, when are you going to own that? And the answer is, I could say it, but then you walk away, and a few minutes later, you're back into your world again. And everything is gone. You know, and listen, it took me a while. Uh, I learned and understood that, oh, my God, this is how it works. And I was so excited. I wanted to get people, I wanted to tell anybody, to listen to the <laughs> science. This is how it works. So I, I beginning, got some people together, and I started to go off. Let me tell you how to create the most beautiful life experience. And then they'd look at me and they'd go, you know, Lipton, for a guy who says you know this, your, your life doesn't look that good. Interesting. It was my wake-up call that said, how the hell can I talk about how wonderful this is and I'm not practicing it? And I immediately said to myself, no, don't go out there and talk to anybody about this. Why? Until you do it. So what were the, what were the things that were holding you back before you've discovered this? And then what was the new program that you started to implement for yourself on a consistent basis to have a hundred percent upgraded program? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things professionally, okay, I was doing a great job. I, I had a great professorship in a medical school, all that kind of stuff. For, you know, personally, my life sucked. <laughs> really? I could get a relationship off the ground. I go, why not? And I go, well, now that I know about it, I was programmed about relationships by observing my father and my mother. Well, they had dysfunctional relationships. So what do you think I downloaded? Dysfunction. Yeah. So my conscious mind goes forward and says, yeah, I want to have a great relationship. I get into it. My subconscious mind steps up and says, oh, this is how we do a relationship. You, Ooh, uh-oh, <laughs> game over, right. you know? Why? Because I didn't see the negative behaviors that I was putting out. My partner, potential partner saw them and gave them cause for alarm. I don't think I want to be with this guy, you know, that was me. <laughs> uh, and then I realized that. And that's when I really had to go in first thing and start to change. Who am I? And I'll tell you the biggest problem uh, now after years of working, people do not love themselves. Mm. And I say, what does that mean? I said, if you have a program where you don't love yourself, then rationally, logically, can anybody else love you? And the answer no. is no. Because you don't think you're lovable. That's right. And somebody says you are, that, oh, I love you. And then you go, well, you know, you probably don't have any quality control. I know I'm not lovable. What's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> and then at some point you push them away and then they're not there. And then you go, I'm not lovable. Nobody's here. <laughs> I, I push them away, you know? And I changed that. I was nearly, what, 45 years old, 40 some years mm. old. And I had zero quality relationships for all that life. Right. I changed the program. And within a couple of years, I, I'm now with my partner, Margaret. Uh, and, and the fact is, she was involved with a um, workshop training program for people. So she understood processing and stuff. And when I came and we added the science and the processing, uh, we've been living a honeymoon for 26 mm. years. Really? 26 years waking up every day going, wow, still here. Another day for fun. Another day for being in love. It was great. And it still is. But if I didn't change the program, that would never have been part of my life at all. I would have been my whole life struggling. 
It's been a very strange year on this planet. Chaos is happening all over the place. And we're looking at this going on, what's going on with our world? It seems like it's turning upside down. The answer is, it is turning upside down. Now that might be the bad news for most people, but it's actually, for my insight, it represents the good news. You go, how could it be the good news that the world is so filled with chaos? And the answer is simply this, is that human behavior has precipitated the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet, which includes us. Five times in the history, life was thriving on this planet and some event like a comet hitting the earth upended the entire ecosystem, wiping out up to 90% of life. This is the sixth mass extinction and the source of this is much closer to home than a comet because the source of our extinction is human behavior. We are undermining the web of life and as a result there's a collapse of nature going on all around us. If we don't change we're going to go extinct. I'm not talking a thousand years folks, I'm talking decades from now. So what you're seeing is a collapse of a foundation. Civilization is changing so rapidly. COVID has pushed it super fast. All of things are changing with the COVID, the way we work on the world and we commute on the world, things like that are profoundly different now and we're moving into a different way of life. We are not going back to the old way of life. We are creating a new version. So when you look at the world falling apart, don't be afraid, actually be very joyous. Why? If it doesn't fall apart, extinction is right here in a few decades. If it falls apart, it gives us an opportunity to create something better to move from here to there. Frequently, I'm asked every day, <laughs> how come you look so happy? And the answer is, I wake up happy. And why do I get this happiness? Where is it coming from? And the answer is this, it's another day on planet Earth. And what's so exciting about it is, it's another day that I have no idea what's going to happen, but the greatest wishes and desires for some fun and excitement and a very joyous life. So I start off with, today's going to be a great day. And almost every day, it ends up being a great day. Doesn't mean everything works right, but the beautiful part about it is, I've really learned not to carry anything forward that is not really happy and joyous in my life. Uh, it reminds me of a story. Two Buddhist monks are walking along, and Buddhist monks are not allowed to touch women at all. And these two Buddhist monks are walking along, and they come to a river, and at that river, there's a woman dressed in her wedding refinery, and she's crying, and she's crying because she can't get across the river wearing these clothes. So one of the monks just picks her up, carries her across, drops her off on the other side. Then the two monks continue walking. And about an hour and a half down the road, one monk says to the other one, how could you pick up a woman? And the one who picked up the woman looked at him and said, I, I dropped her off an hour and a half ago. Why are you still carrying her? And the whole idea about that is the meaning of it is when events happen in our life, it's not necessary to keep carrying them, especially if they're negative ones. You can just stop right there and go on to the next thing. It's a choice. Do I want to be in an environment where I'm not happy? Or do I want to be in an environment where I am happy? Oh, choice? Well, obviously. But most of us have that choice, but are so caught up in conventional rules and conventional way of mannerisms and social structure that oh, we hold ourselves in places we don't even want to be. And then we sit there in our mind getting aggravated by the whole fact of, I don't even want to be here. And I go, well, then guess what? Choice. Pick a place you want to be. Go to the movie. Go do something else. Break the pattern. And when you break the pattern is your moment of power. Because when the pattern is broken, there's new choices at that moment. But if you don't break the pattern, you're going to follow a litany of up or down, depending how you started off the process. The litany down, not a great trip, I'll tell you that. But hey, I think it's over 20 some years. I haven't been depressed. I haven't even been angry. I get upset by some things, of course, but it doesn't mean I hold them. I drop that person off on the other side of the river and stop carrying it. And this is the choice. It really is a choice. You have to think about it because it's, it's a conscious awakening at a moment that gives you a choice that wakes up and goes, do I want to do this? And that's that moment of choice. You take that moment of choice and then you say, I'm moving into where I want to go. You make a habit out of this because you repeat this. And then guess what? You don't even have to think about it anymore because the subconscious program will always redirect you to the place you want to be. And the whole other world that we used to experience that used to irritate us and aggravate us and all that anxiety stuff, 
It just doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean everything's going right. But the whole beautiful part about it is, well, if it doesn't go right, okay, stop now. Let's go do something else. Because it's the idea, it didn't go right, and then why didn't it go right, and who didn't make it right, and where is it going to go now, and blah, blah, blah. And what are you doing? You're digging a hole, and it's not going up, it's going down. And the whole idea is choice. But the most important part of choice is you have to stop long enough, not get caught up in, in, the, in the program, and play out the program. There's a moment while you're playing the program, maybe you can separate and look at yourself and say, why am I doing this? Because that is the moment of power. That is the moment where you can say, I have a choice. I can do something totally different than to stew in this stuff. And then you are a powerful person. The subconscious mind is 1 million times more powerful and works 95% of the time versus the small conscious mind working 5%. I say, that's the one that's stressed. That's the one that's struggling. It says, I want something and I'm not getting it and I'm going to make it. And I go, you're trying to change the world when your own behavior was the one that was sabotaging it. And that's because you didn't see your programs. And like Bill, you engage these programs and you don't even know you have these programs. But then, as I said, well, if you want to see your programs, your life, 95% coming from the program, your life is a printout of your programs. The things you like, as I said, they come in, they came in because you have a program to acknowledge them. But if you understand the things you struggle over are not because the outside is preventing you from getting there. It was your own invisible 95% of the day playing programs you didn't even know you had. And that's where the sabotage comes from. And yet we want to blame and fix everybody on the outside and think that we're just the recipients of all this without recognizing we're the creator of all this. And that sounds like, oh, so new agey. And I go, listen, quantum physics is the most valid science on this planet. And principle number one, quantum physics, consciousness is creating our life experiences. You want to change your life? You don't change the world. You change your own consciousness the world changes after that. Whatever you're waiting for, be it peace of mind, contentment, health, it will surely come, but only when you're ready to receive it with openness and gratitude. Of all the characteristics needed for both a happy and morally decent life, none surpasses gratitude. Happiness and health are the just rewards for living in gratitude. Wow, I remember the first time I read that. I doubted that gratitude could give me health and happiness, but now I know differently. Igor, Igor, how sweet of you to remember my birthday. Listen, let me blow out the candles, make a wish, and then we'll have a party later. Ah, yes, another year would be wonderful. Ah, well, you know what? That whole story that Ben Franklin told us about gratitude and health, well, it actually works. And now scientifically we know why. Because built into every one of our cells is the fountain of youth. <laughs> What's the fountain of youth in the cell? Well, it's something called telomeres. Telomeres, they are special parts of the DNA. So when you open up the nucleus of the cell, the chromosomes come out, and there are 46 chromosomes, 23 from your mother and 23 from your father. But what is a chromosome? Well, what it is is a sleeve of protein wrapped around a double helix of DNA. And the significance about this is the telomeres, as you can see in this picture of an X and Y chromosome, stained red are the telomeres at the ends of the chromosome, where the ends of the DNA are. I say, so what is the telomere? It's extensions of DNA after the genes, meaning it's a part of the DNA that doesn't program anything. It's just extended DNA. Happiness and gratitude, now that's the big one. Happiness and gratitude means you love your life so much that you want more. So unconsciously, you will activate the enzyme to increase and enhance your life. This is also associated with a positive outlook because if you have a positive outlook, that means you're looking toward a future and again, feedback says then we're going to have to activate this enzyme to have that future. 
And the last two aspects that enhance the enzyme and give you long life are very important, and that is, again, having that self-love, appreciating yourself, which means I'm enjoying and appreciating my life experience. And when you're in love, that, of course, drives you to stay around even longer, and that will activate the enzyme. And lastly, and most importantly, is being in service, meaning you have something to do. And what the feedback of the system is says, I can't end now, I have to be here longer, I have something to do. And so being in service is one of the most important things to extend your telomeres and keep you around. And in conclusion, the information about telomeres and telomerase is very important because they represent the equivalent of a fountain of youth in every cell. And between your mind and your cells, the biology of belief reveals how your consciousness and your thoughts can extend your telomeres by activating telomerase when you appreciate life, when you have gratitude, and when you're looking for love and happiness on the planet, you can extend your life. So interesting, you're very powerful to change your life and make it one of happiness, joy, and health for a long, long time. A lack of knowledge is a lack of power. Mm -hmm. And I say, you're suffering out here because you feel you have no power. And if you really understand the biology that we're talking about and the spirituality that you're talking about, and you start to recognize it, you recognize, oh my God, you are so powerful, and yet you have a belief of victim. And mm -hmm. since belief controls it, no matter how powerful you are, if your belief is you're a victim, then you are a victim. And yes. we have been uh, victimized by beliefs that are incorrect. And, uh, uh, and I, if we adjust the science, it automatically then comes right together with the whole spiritual message that Agape and, and my brother Reverend here uh, have been providing for years. Uh, but there's a scientific context to it because a yeah. lot of people go, well, this is scientific. I go, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, what, what are those flawed beliefs that, that we've been living under all these years? Well, there are four of them. Yeah. And two of them are actually part of Darwinian theory, which I'll mention. But the first one that's really important is people have been programmed the belief that the genes they inherited at conception are programming the rest of their life. The, the genes, we didn't select them as far as we know. If you don't like the characteristics, you can't change these genes. And yeah. then we add on top of that, we say, and the genes turn on and off by themselves. And all of a sudden you start to realize then I'm not running my life. The genes are running my life. Oh my God, there's cancer in the family and their genes are going, I'm going to get a cancer gene. I'm and I said, what's the belief? You already got the belief. I'm going to get cancer. I go, this is trouble right there. Right, right, and right, right. Just a little sidebar because I love this sidebar. There's not one gene that causes cancer. Cancer is not caused by a gene. Cancer is caused by disharmony in your life. Uh, unresolved anger is the mm. biggest one. Mm -hmm. uh, feeling lost, left out, you know, not part of something is another one that separates you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I want people to understand that because so many people say, oh, I've got this cancer and the gene does, and I'm just a victim back here, and the genes took this, and genes made this, and I go, stop. You are co-creating with those genes. The gene does not turn on and off and the gene does not control things. The gene responds to the environment. And if your perception of the environment is not in harmony and support of your life, that disharmony is what can activate a gene. A gene is a blueprint, just like in an architect's office. And I mentioned, I say, you go into an architect office and she's working on a blueprint. You ask her and you say, hey, is your blueprint on or off? And she'd look at you like, what are you crazy? It's a blueprint. Mm -hmm. There's no on and off. I go, yes. DNA is a blueprint to make the proteins of the body. It cannot turn itself on and off. You need an architect. <gasps> Consciousness, mind is architect. Right. That turns the genes on and can modify the readout of the genes. Consciousness is controlling your genetic activity. When, when people follow the fate of a child adopted into a family where there's cancer, they find that the adopted child will get the same family cancer at the same probability as any of the natural siblings. So an adopted child picks up that, gets that cancer. But here's the point. The adopted child came from totally different genetics. So it was not the genetics that push that cancer. It was being adopted into a family where the programming was not giving them uh, wholeness, health, happiness. Uh, it, it, it's just uh, stressful, very stressful yeah. programming. And as you said, stress. American Psychological Association recognizes 90% of doctor visits 
or stress-related visits. And, and the, the, we don't focus on the stress. That's like, oh, a side thing. I say, no, it's not a side thing. It's the number one thing that is coming from the top down. Uh, and the genes, genes are blueprints to make the proteins of the body, 100,000 different proteins, like building blocks, okay? Proteins are complex molecules, and they wear out. Proteins wear out all the time. So you have to replace them. I said, well, how do you replace this complex molecule? And the answer is DNA is a blueprint to make a protein. I go, so what? And I go, well, you go into an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint. And, you, and I say, well, ask her, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at it and go, what are you talking about? It's a blueprint. It's so on and off. I go, precisely. Genes cannot turn themselves on and off. They don't self-actualize. They're controlled by environmental signals. And all of a sudden, oh my God. Well, if the environment is controlling this and you're programming in the environment, your lifestyle in the environment, and all these other things now become the primary controlling factor of your genes, not the genes. And we have to let go because when I was programming the doctors that, oh, genes turn on and off and all that stuff, I was programming that people are victims because, as I said, as far as you know, you didn't pick the genes, you can't change them. They operate by themselves. And so we were programming victim. And then it turns out the new science of epigenetics is not victim. You're the one that's actually controlling it with the, your behavior. If my thoughts are distorted because of animal soul, when I broadcast these thoughts, I'm not activating what I want. <laughs> I'm activating what the program wants. And I started to realize that because the magnetic field, as you said, is shaping our experiences in this world at this point. And that's what you can read with magnetoencephalograph. You're reading these fields, which are your thoughts. And then I started to realize when the field is being mainly run by the animal soul, I'm not controlling that. That was the automatic program. <laughs> that's a program. That's not me. That's program. And I realized I could observe me doing the program. But there's a point like you recognize, there's a point to say, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm the controller. I don't want that program. I want to use my human soul to run the show. And as you said, same thing. Once you start coming from the human soul, you override the animal soul. And that's when you become the creator. And because of our creation, not only is information coming in, but as the magnetoencephalograph shows, the information going out, and I say, it affects the world we're living in. Okay, that's the experience you have now. But it also goes back to the original spirit. And this is the karma part where my life experience has distorted mm -hmm. my spiritual broadcast. And I say, well, how, how do I get back? And I say, it's very simple. You just have to know who you are. <laughs> and this is what you said, and it's true. Most people have no idea who they are. They think they're this physical body. And I said, that's what I used to think when I was conventional science. But once I understood the physics and the role of energy and consciousness and spirit, the game changed for me. I said, wait a minute. I don't want to be animal soul. I want to be Bruce's soul. Mm -hmm. I want Bruce's to create this, not the, not the program from mother and father and culture. I don't want that one. I want one. And like you, I started to recognize, well, wait, I can change. I can now, I want to take the control now. I want to put my hands back on the steering wheel. I want to drive this. I don't want the program to drive this. You know, the cell phone that you have in your hand, yeah, you can drive it by talking into it, but it also can work by itself because it's got program. And I think that you and I have this information that we've been trying to present to the world to say, take back the control because you're more than this body. Well, I could live in a perfectly healthy, happy environment that will support me. But if I perceive it's a negative environment, then my cells inside my body do not know that it is a healthy environment. They only see the perception that I send to them.
And this is why perception becomes so important is because the cells are not directly touching the environment and depend on the nervous system's interpretation to adjust their biology. So if I change my perception, my mind, change my belief about life, I change the signals that are going in and adjusting the function of the cell. The point is very, very significant, and that is this. I'm not a victim of my genes because I, uh, by my ability to change my environment and by my ability to change my perception of the environment, have the ability to control my genetic activity. I'm not a victim of my heredity. I'm a master of my genetic activity. Well, how do you change a program? That was the issue. Not how you change the conscious mind. How do you change the subconscious mind? Because it doesn't learn. Conscious mind learns by just whatever you read the book. I learned it. Okay. Uh, subconscious mind doesn't learn that way. I say, how does it learn? I say, well, in the first seven years, that's when I said the programming went in. The brain wasn't functioning at the higher level of consciousness. It was actually a little lower. That was called theta, the vibration, the imagination and all that. That's hypnosis. Okay. So the first way we learned programs was hypnosis because the, the, the function of the brain wasn't, it was at a high, uh, at a low, uh, you know, lower vibration. Uh, some people might remember the old days when hypnotherapy, they, they'd have a watch and the hypnotherapist said, uh, you know, swing the watch back and forth and they would say, you're getting tired. You're getting tired. Uh, and, and what was the point? When you get tired, you lower the vibration of the brain. And the moment you fall asleep, actually, consciously, the next level of activity of the brain is theta before it goes down to the lowest vibration, delta sleep. So every night when you go to bed, there's a period just after you close your eyes and you're essentially disconnected for a moment, your brain is operating in theta. Well, theta is hypnosis, okay? So I said, well, that's how you, you, your brain was in theta during that childhood period as predominantly. Now you're an adult. I say, yeah, but you have theta every night when you go to bed. So I said, what can you do? And this is the old story. You've heard people do it. You put a pair of earphones on at night. You play a program that you want to be true in your life. You, and while you're awake, you might hear the program, but it's the moment you fall asleep, the conscious mind shut off, but the subconscious mind is now in record theta. So whatever is coming through the earphones at that moment after you fall asleep, you don't hear it but the subconscious mind is hearing it and downloading it in a state of theta. So the first way of changing a belief system is to get into theta. Uh, and this is called self-hypnosis. Put the earphones on, play the program, programs for health, happiness, love, joy, whatever, uh, and just go to sleep, which is really cool because you don't have any, there's no studying here. <laughs> you just play the program. Yeah. We become less intelligent when we're afraid. And then yeah, I say, well, boy. look at the world today. It's chaos. It's fear. I mean, the COVID thing scared everybody so much. They said, don't even talk to anybody. Put your mask on. Keep away from everybody. The businesses shut down. But I said, oh, my God, this is fear. And I go, that is the result. And that happens inside the body. Everything shuts down that would keep you going when you're in a state of fear. And this is why over 90% of illness is directly related to the stress that we're living in, in this world. And you might say, well, what about cancer? I'm going to tell you a most important fact. Just listen to this. There is not one gene that causes cancer. Ah, what about all the cancer genes? I say, no, those are genes that will support the cancer but they're not genes that cause the cancer. I go, well, wait, there's no genes that cause cancer? I say, no. I said, then what's the cause? You ready? Disharmony in the biology. Remember, your cells are a community. Think about it this way. If you have a, a, a bad leader of the community, a bad president or prime minister, I go, then what happens? I say, there's not happiness in the community. Disharmony. And I said, what if you have a good leader? And I said, then the community is right behind them, supporting them. So I said, but your mind is the leader. I say, is your mind sending good information? I'm healthy, I'm happy, I'm strong, I'm in love, I'm enjoying my life. Or is your mind sending, be careful, be afraid, watch out, somebody's going to get you, you're not going to have this. I go, what's the difference? And I go, huh, the difference is that stress hormone. It uh, shuts down your maintenance of your body. It shuts down your immune system. 
and it shuts down your intelligence. And when you stop using your intelligence, that's what's controlling the community of 50 trillion cells. So all of a sudden it becomes important to recognize your consciousness, your thoughts are the government. What I really would like to let people know is while the world looks totally crazy at this moment, this is a very important part of our evolution. And the reason is uh, human civilization has been destroying the planet that we are now facing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. Uh, and, and since we are the ones that are causing it, it is based on our culture and the way we've been living and not treating nature with love and respect that we are losing contact. And so what we see is breaking down is an old way of life that has actually caused the problems and that we're facing a new evolution. And to do that, you, you can't build it on the foundation where the problem is. Mm -hmm. So when you see the foundation breaking, I'm not afraid. As a matter of fact, I'm so like, yeah, it's faking because that's the only way we can build a new one. So I just want people to realize when you see the world falling apart, it's not the bad news, it's actually the good news because if we kept it the same way, extinction is looming right in front of us and I'm not talking a thousand years, I'm talking of decades. And so, um, welcome to the evolution. I think this is one of the best things that we both can do right now is to help people recognize how truly powerful they are, even though they've been programmed to say, I'm a victim. I say, no, you're not. Uh, and there's a science behind it. And that's why I love talking with you, because there's the spiritual part, which I never was spiritual for 40 years. I was a science guy, genes, chromosomes, blah, blah, blah. And then in the study of the cells, the cells taught me that we're not even in here. We're right. broadcast playing through here. And uh, and when you understand why, which was which blew my mind because hey, I wasn't spiritual, and all of a sudden I said, Oh my goodness, the cells have little antennas on them, and each of us has a different set of these antennas, which are receiving a broadcast. Yes. In physics, you might say the word field, which is uh, let me define it: invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. And I go, same definition for spirit, invisible moving forces influence the physical world. I said, oh, my God, quantum physics has revealed to us that we're this energy spirit and we come in and play through the body and our each of our bodies have a different sets of antennas. So no two people get the same station. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, my God, you know, after 40 some years of not even believing in it in two minutes, I turn around and go. Of course, everything is spiritual now. <laughs> so, but, you know, the meaning of it for me, Michael, was so great because you know what happened? Fear. Yeah, you had a you had a kind of an, an instantaneous like oh. epiphany. It just changed your life. The lightning hit me. Yeah, uh, and and what was interesting within seconds, I lost fear. Mm. Because I understand that because the greatest fear people have is death. Yes. What if you don't die? Because the field is always here, whether the body, which I call the television set, right. you're watching the Bruce show on the television set here, but the Bruce show is a broadcast being picked up and played through the show. And I realized uh, you can't die. You're not even in here. Right. <laughs> Where's right. the energy around here? Uh, right. And, and right. then, but then, you know, being a, a inquisitive scientist, I, I remember, I'll never forget it. I sat there, he's just like, oh my God, there's a spirit and there's a body and a spirit. And my science mind said, why not just be a spirit? Why have a body? And then I found out I had what I refer to as Jewish comedian cells. Because <laughs> I, asked, I asked a question, why have both a body and a spirit? And the cells answered with a question that came right up in my head. That, and the answer is like, it's so profound and so funny. I said, why have a spire in the body? And the, and the cell said, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? <laughs> now, you have to take that one in for a little bit and realize yeah. something is that this body translates energy environments into pictures and sounds and smells and feelings uh, and all these things. And I go, oh, my God, we came here to experience life it's called Rory McIlroy, who uh, he was leading the Masters golf tournament a few years back. He had a big lead. And, you know, this is just one example. I'm not having a go at Rory. Yeah. This is just, it's common in all sports where um, people almost self-implode. And for a few holes, 
like he could barely swing the golf club. What was really interesting is, as I was sort of reading a lot about it, trying to figure out what what's going on here, it's this conscious subconscious, again, where he knows how to drive the golf ball, you know, better than most people on the planet. Yes. So he's playing usually from his subconscious. The patterns are in, he knows how to shape the ball right to left, left to right, whatever. But in that moment where it's like, oh man, I'm leading the masters, I need to be really careful now. He's trying to think, you know, well, certainly this is what people say. I don't know what was in his mind, but you're almost overthinking. You're now trying to control something that you could naturally do, as you say, driving. Yeah. If you were thinking about when do I put the clutch down or what timing is it with the accelerator, you know, if you if you drive a manual, it's it's the same kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. But uh, in fact, really, when, when he's playing the game, He's playing it in the conscious mind, in the sense that he has a vision. I'm going to hit this ball, and it's going to go into that hole over there. He, uh, very important, because you, there's a destination, and there's a means to that destination. It turns out, and this is really most important, is if you focus on the destination and not on the means, let the system, which is so powerful, mm-hmm. to, it, it will get there without you telling it how to get there. But when you start to interfere and say, okay, now i got to make sure I swing it right, my head's level, my grip is right, yeah. uh, and all of a sudden you, you're putting all those details in, it's like, no, don't focus on the details. You forgot what the end was. The end was the ball is supposed to go over the, there. Uh, uh, and so uh, that starts to come in because now you're trying to control everything with your, you know, with this manual control. And it's like, no, uh, you don't have to have the manual control. Matter of fact, that gets in the way. Yeah. The, the body knows what you want. You don't have to tell it how to get there. And that's a big issue in our lives because uh, I want to be successful. How? Oh, th- I got to do this. I got to do this. And I say, oh, well, you're, you're planning all these things. Uh, and y- your, your conscious mind is not even any, uh, the subconscious is a million times more powerful a computer than the conscious mind. So I say, you're going to take this little small conscious mind and try to run the bigger computer. It's like, that doesn't work. Let go of the control. And this is the whole thing. I mean, it's a, I, I, I just came to my mind. A lot of people say, let go, let God, or something like that. There's some phrase that people always say. And I go, well, that's actually the way to do it. Focus on what you want, but don't try and tell the universe how it's going to happen. Don't tell them that I'm going to do this and this is going to happen. I go, no, you just focus on what you want. The intelligence of the supercomputer, the subconscious supercomputer, uh, it will handle it unless yeah. you put your hands into the machine. I said, keep your hands out of the machine. Focus on where that ball is going to go. I mean, he already practiced. Remember I said, we did the habit. We did the practice. You, whether you're driving the car or hitting the golf ball. Practice, practice. You don't think about the details of driving when you're driving. You know, they just automatically, you could have conversation, you could be off in thought, and you're still driving the car. What is the immune system? Well, generally it's something that protects me. From what? from things that get inside your body. And I said, well, why should things want to get inside my body in the first place? Let's just set up a scenario. You're out there in the world, and I drop you off in the wilderness, and I say, okay, survive. And one of the things you have to do is start finding food. And you're going to spend all your time, maybe find nothing, and you're going to be looking for food. And here's an alternative vision. I drop you out in an eat-all-you-can buffet. Well. You don't have to worry about food. It's being served to you all the time. What does this have to do with the immune system? I go like this. Bacteria, parasites that live out in the environment have to struggle for their survival to find food. But underneath your skin, the tissues inside your body are flush with fluid from the blood. And in that fluid are all the nutrients and elements necessary for growth. So if a bacteria could find itself inside to your body, it would be sitting pretty. All it'd have to do is just sit there and food would be constantly delivered from an individual circulatory system. So the idea is, well, yeah, then obviously this is a nice environment that uh, invasive organisms would like to find themselves in because it's, it's like free food, well, you know, no probs. So, okay, so what does this mean? It says, well, then we have to have a defense system. Because if invasive organisms get in there, not only will they utilize the food we make, but they could create a toxic waste environment that could actually undermine our health. So 
we can't afford to have invasive organisms come into us and take over. And the immune system's job is an internal protection system, as opposed to, for example, the adrenal system, fight or flight, which protects you from threats on the outside. Immune system protects you from threats on the inside. So I said, well, how does it work? Well, the immune system is an intelligent system. Because what is the function of the immune system? To go out into the world of their body and look for things that are new that came in and then not only recognize them but learn about them so that they could create antibodies, for example, to effectively knock them out. So the immune system's character is learning and memory. I go, wow, what a coincidence. This is the character of the nervous system. Point. The immune system is an extension of the nervous system, learning and memory about the environment in which you live. So I said, well, how does it work? Well, I say that there are organisms that prefer to find the interior of our body as a place to live because it's so much easier for them just to sit there and uh, live off of your energy and your nourishment. So the old story is, oh, the immune system uh, protects self, my body, against invading organisms as everything else is called not self. Well, I go, that's a crude insight, but it's not anywhere near accurate for a simple reason. The immune system identifies things that get into the body that cause disruption of the system. And its job is to identify them, mark them, and eliminate them. And I go, but there, you know, there are many organisms that live with us that are part of us. It's called the microbiome. Thousands of species of organisms, bacteria and parasites living with us. I say, the immune system doesn't attack them. The reason is this. They support our viability. They support who we are. So self versus not self, that's not the discriminating factor of the immune system factor of the immune system is anything that's disruptive to the system. Well, guess what? That not only includes organisms that came from the outside, but even our own cells, if they go rogue, like go into a cancer state, the immune system's job is to eliminate them. So basically, the function of the immune system is to keep harmony in the system. Any organism that comes in that disrupts harmony, function of the immune system, eliminate it. Energy psychology is a new version of psychology that engages something called super learning. Super learning, what's that? I go, maybe you've seen somebody read a book by moving their finger down the page. Mm -hmm. Just as fast as they move that finger down the page, they read everything on both, you know, on the page, on both pages, boom, they could just read it. So the idea is this, well, if you can engage super learning and uh, use that in downloading a new behavior, you ready? You can change a belief you had your whole life, 50, 60 years, you can change that in minutes. Because super learning is the equivalent of pushing the record button on, on the subconscious. Super learning allows you to download a new program in minutes. Uh, and we need that. Why? Because the behavior that the <laughs> culture and civilization using today is so out of harmony with nature that mm -hmm. humans are causing their own extinction at this moment. It's called a mass extinction. NASA scientists have, have already told us that industrial civilization, the one we're in, uh, is facing, and I, I want to emphasize this because it was in the title of their report, and I just I said, we are facing an irreversible collapse of civilization in the next couple of decades. Well, we're seeing it right now. Civilization is not working. The chaos that's all over the planet is a sign that it does not work this way. And if we don't change, then we're facing our own extinction. Here's a simple truth. The first 40 years was struggle life. When I did the psyche and all that stuff, the last 30 years has been the most enjoyment I could ever imagine in life. That I even wrote a book called The Honeymoon Effect because uh, the, the harmony of what love brings into the world, you know, when people are on a honeymoon, it's like heaven on earth. And I say, for 30 years, I've been living heaven on earth. And, and every aspect of my life is so beautiful. And why? I changed the limiting programs through the process of psyche. And when I put in programs that gave me uh, the values I wanted, mm -hmm. the joy, which is so really important about it, is yeah. I didn't have to work on it. Once the program was in there, the subconscious running 95% of the day automatically, without my even participating consciously, 
I was finding heaven without even making an effort to get there. Mm -hmm. And I am living in this most wonderful life. No doctors, yeah. no pharmaceutical drugs, uh, no insurance. <laughs> you either. No. Me either. <laughs> Why should I spend the money for insurance? I, know, I haven't had insurance since 1992. Yeah, I so, haven't either. Uh, and, and the fact is what? Who needs it? I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not planning to do that. Right. And the idea is what we really ultimately come down to is life isn't a bunch of accidents that we move through. Life is a bunch of creations. And if your life is a struggle, uh, we always have a tendency to say, oh, the universe is against me or right. something like that. I'm a victim mentality. I'm a victim. I can't, yeah. Oh, it's out oh, of my no. control. It's, that's the problem, not me. Right. And once you understand the basis of the new biology and the psyche process, you start to recognize, wait, I am a co-creator of my life. Right. And if my programs are not really good, then my life will not be really good. Changing those programs... And here I am today with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and look how beautiful this Aww. woman is. Look how she wonderful she is. She sparkles <laughs> and shines. Why? When we clean up the, the problems that we acquired in our development, mm -hmm. then life comes to us. You don't even have to go out and chase it anymore. Right. And that is the 100% difference. First 40 years, I'm going to go get that success. Yeah. Last 30 years, Let open the door. Oh, here you are. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, all I can say is the most exciting experience in my life was to take back control. Bruce, do you have uh, in your work a, a general perspective on, or a definition or a way that you look at addiction? Well, basically what I have to understand about biology is that throughout evolution, um, biological systems are given information in response to how they, re how they deal with the world around them. We call them emotions, sensations, feelings, symptoms, etc. like that. One of the major aspects is this, is that nature has designed uh, two senses of pain and pleasure uh, as a way of teaching an organism to go in the right direction. In other words, we're smart, we go to school, we learn, you know, cross the street, look both ways and all that kind of stuff like that. But uh, you got smaller, lower forms of life, animals that are, are moving through the world. How do they know where to go and where not to go? How to, to do the right thing to stay alive? Well, nature uh, has endowed them with a, a sense of feeling. And the significance about that is we are given two completely opposite senses. One is pain and one is pleasure. Hmm. When pleasure is uh, received by an organism or perceived by an organism, it really represents that you're doing the right thing. And that's why nature encourages you, says, look, this is really good, go this way. But when you start to do something that threatens your survival or is really not supportive, uh, we receive a sensation of pain. And that's nature's way of saying, look, <laughs> this is threatening to you, this is you know, inappropriate behavior, whatever it is, do something different. Hmm. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because uh, in our civilization and throughout history, that was manipulated a bit by, by the original church, uh, which looked at uh, pleasure as <laughs> negative and pain as positive, which is like complete turnaround of the table of biology. Some confusing but, messages there. <laughs> uh, absolutely. But it, it, it really causes a, a profound um, conflict in our biology. When our biology is telling us we're doing something right, gives us pleasure, and then our psychology is saying, no, no, that's wrong. Don't do that. Uh, then we have a conflict between programming and biology. Hmm. And, and so basically what I see is this, is that when we find ourselves in trauma and problems, uh, A, we try to seek a way to get out. If you can't seek a way to get out, then you actually do some kind of other behavior or something else to, uh, to lessen the pain. Because uh, if you can't move and you're stuck in pain, then what are you supposed to do? Just live in that? Well, at our level of cognition and awareness, we can put in some other behavior and, 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 and then actually uh, override the, the current experience. Hmm. So what we have to recognize is when people really are generally dealing with an addiction problem, they're really first trying to overcome some kind of pain in their life or threat to their survival or their existence and then choose another alternative behavior. Unfortunately, the alternative behaviors don't necessarily take you out of the problem. Hmm. So you stay in the problem, uh, but even though you're trying to get mentally out of the problem.
Knowledge is power, and lack of knowledge is a lack of power. When people don't know that they're involved with their own life and their own genetics and their own behavior because they're programmed to be the victim, then they become a victim because they have no knowledge of this. And uh, and what you're doing, what I'm doing, is let, let's wake up. You are powerful if you understand how this works. And if you don't understand how it works, you just say, no, it's not me. I'm not in control. And, uh, and people walk away feeling like there's nothing I can do. The G Genes are controlling this, and I don't control the genes. I go, well, that's the story that's wrong. <laughs> and when people are allowed to walk away from a, a medical practitioner with that belief, then that practitioner in no way has helped that patient because the idea is this. As you said, I've got to help them get a better attitude when they walk out of this building. I have to give them more power so that yeah. they have more power because if they walk out saying, there's nothing I can do, uh, then the game is over at that point. What is happening right now in the world, in society, that you see where things are, are ramping up or are they? <laughs> and why well, is it more, more important now than ever? Go ahead. Okay, uh, we're in the process of an evolutionary upheaval at this very this very time moment, and the upheaval is due to crises. And we see the crises around the world, whether it's economic, religious, racial, whatever you want. I say those are trees in a forest. And I say if you get back a little further away, you can see the bigger crisis is uh, we are facing an imminent extinction of human civilization. Uh, and and it's, this is real. <laughs> uh, and the public uh, ha has been made aware of it a long time ago and then sort of disappeared that we are facing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet, which means five times uh, there were previous mass extinctions. And, and the point about it, we always think evolution is one continuous, you know, from beginning to end. It's like, no, it starts, stops, breaks, starts again, stops, breaks. And it's done five times the last uh, mass extinctions 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs were here and a comet hit near Mexico, upended the web of life, and then all of a sudden 75% of uh, all species disappeared uh, when that, after that comet. Uh, but today we're in what's called the sixth mass extinction, and why I'm, we're bringing it here, Abraham and Tara, is basically because science has recognized for the last, oh my God, 15 years or more, that human civilization, human behavior is undermining the web of life, leading to our own extinction. <laughs> uh, and just see, is there a number? I'll give you an interesting number. The uh, World Wildlife Foundation in 1970 took a survey, how many animals on planet Earth? Uh, they recently redid the survey. Two thirds of the entire animal population of the planet has disappeared since the first time they did it. Uh, we're losing species of organism faster than in some previous, as I said, five mass extinctions. Yeah. The significance is this human behavior is now has been recognized as the cause of this. We are undermining our environment, uh, uh, thinking that we are, you know, in dominant and control of the environment. No, we are the environment, you, you, you know, uh, the, you know, the grandeur of human thinking is a we can control and dominate nature is like, well, how's that working? And the answer is facing mass extinction in the next few decades, period. So we have to change behavior. Cancer is a program. And you can change cancer by changing the program. But if you believe the cancer is uh, genetically controlled, which means you have no control, then you all of a sudden say, I'm a victim. And then you want to kill all the cancer cells because that's the technology. And I go, the cancer cells are not the problem. They're the symptom. <laughs> that's the result of a problem. And so you can kill all the damn cancer cells you want, but you never got to the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem was something that caused a cell to become cancer. And all of a sudden we go back to the consciousness and the programming. And the same thing, diabetes type 2, 100% percent environment 100 percent environment uh, and and i go so why is this important because as you've been talking about let's get away from the idea that i am a genetically programmed individual no i'm a creator <laughs> and i'm creating this and the emphasis is how through the blood the chemistry two parts nutrition and information and the idea about it is this if you fail on the nutrition, it's like you, you, the machine will break down. 
That's what the function is. If you don't take care of the car, it breaks down. When you look in the junkyard and you see all the cars piled up, I say, is that because they were built wrong, genetically incorrect? I go, no, no. It was driver error that put those cars into the junkyard. It's driver error that's responsible for 99% of disease on this planet. Start taking care of ourselves. And all of a sudden, it's like instead of being out on the road, okay, uh, you know, I, I look at what I eat quite differently. Uh, I'm feeding 50 trillion cells in my community. And uh, I like to, you know, I, I know for the biological reason of giving them the healthiest, finest uh, nourishment possible. Because as a person who used to grow cell tissue culture, uh, culture medium is the equivalent of blood and we grow cells in it. And if you compromise the composition of that culture medium in any way, the cells will get sick and die. Uh, and so we have to learn how to take care of that. So people are learning a little bit about that. We also have to uh, uh, understand vitamins and supplements are really good for us, especially vitamin C. It's great for immune system. A lot of it. It's really good. Uh, and then start to uh, also look at maybe, uh, which I'm going to go do right after this, is uh, go climb a mountain right here in the uh, out across the road because I need to get some exercise every now and then. That's why when I say in some of my lectures, I say, okay, how many people in here have read a self-help book? And all the hands go up. I say, okay, now how many of you, your lives changed after you read the self-help book? All the hands go back down. I said, well, <laughs> what's the issue? And the issue is this. You educated your conscious mind, the creative mind, by reading a book. But the subconscious mind doesn't learn that way. And it's very important. It's resistant to change. Why? If I learned a habit, I don't want it to change every day. If I learned how to walk, I don't want to have to relearn how to walk all the time. I, if I learned how to do it, then fine. So that basically says, then the subconscious mind is resistant to change. I say number one. So what, so what happens? How does it do it? Like if you're, if you're ah, sober well, a number I of to, years. I have to go back and say, well, how did you educate the, conscious mind, the subconscious mind in the first place? I go, first seven years, hypnosis. That's what the brain was in theta. It was just downloading programs, bypassing consciousness. Conscious, our conscious minds did not filter the download of the programs and say good program, bad program. Why? Conscious mind wasn't working when the downloads were going. So I just got programs. <laughs> Conscious mind wasn't even there. Doesn't even have any idea of it. So <coughs> excuse me. the next issue is this. Okay, your brain is in hypnosis for first seven years, but your subconscious still learns programs after your seven. I say, how does it learn it then? I go, oh, habituation, repetition. Repeat the behavior over and over and over again. Whether, that is whether how, that's a healthy behavior or an unhealthy behavior, you'll learn a new pattern depending on what you practice. Absolutely. Because the, the, the function of that mind is to take pattern that is re, re played over and over again and then acquired. That's why, look, you want to learn how to drive a car? Practice <laughs> drive a car. You want to go back to this one. This is a, learning our ABCs. Go back to your childhood. How long did it take you to get from A to Z? And the answer was, how many times did you start? A, B, C, A, B, C, D, E. <laughs> and then you repeated it, you repeated it, you repeated it, and finally you got to Z. What was the result? I never had to do it again. I habituated it because I repeated it over and over and over again. That's how I learned. How many times did I repeat the times table in school? Uh, whatever issue on a job, I learned to do the job. I learned how to communicate. Uh, all of these different things. So uh, basically, how'd you do that? Repetition. Humans are destroying the environment because we're voracious. We eat everything out there. Take the trees, the plants, the soil. The, we, we take everything. Voracious. And we pushed it to the situation now that the uh, nature can't support us because we, we're breaking the web of life down. And it's asking us to change. And I say, you know, let me give a parallel here that makes sense. Uh, and it's more than just a parallel. I think it's part of a fractal consequence. And that is this. A caterpillar is one of the most voracious insects you've ever seen. You put a caterpillar on a plant like a monarch butterfly and they on a milkweed plant and you put that caterpillar on that milkweed plant, it eat every damn leaf off of that plant. I mean, and I see it right here in, the, in my yard, there's a plant and the, and the caterpillars, the monarchs love that. They put their caterpillars on there. I come back a couple of days later, it's not one single leaf left on the plant. They ate all of the leaves. And I go, then what? I said, well, 
guess what? They reach the end. <laughs> and what do they do? They form what is called a pupa or a chrysalis. And then I say, well, what's that? Well, it's a cocoon. I say, then what's happening in there? I say, it's a miracle what's happening there. I say, what's the consequence of that's happening? I say, a caterpillar came in and a butterfly goes out. I go, wait, what's the difference? I say, the caterpillar is the most voracious, eating everything. And the butterfly that comes out is the lightest touch on the planet, floats in the air, essentially, doesn't destroy anything, and it lives and it, and it enjoys the beauty of it because it's living in harmony. I say, why is it relevant? Now, let's go back to us. I say, we're the caterpillar phase of human civilization. We're eating everything, and we push it against the wall now, and nature says that's it. I say, now what? I say, well, we have to go through a metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. I say, why? We need a civilization that comes out on the other side that's in harmony and health uh, and living in the garden with cooperation. That's what def our destination is. I go, well, wait, how do you go from caterpillar to butterfly? I go, ah, oh, in that chrysalis, that cocoon, what was going on? A caterpillar came in. And then what? Started to break down. And the cells started to come apart and the community started to come apart and the caterpillar started to disappear. And if, if you were a caterpillar cell, you'd go, oh my God, the caterpillar's dying. And I go, what's happening? It's disassembling. And I said, then what's happening? Certain cells called imaginal cells become directors. They say, look, there's a new way to build. Here's a new construction. We're going to build this butterfly. So as cells are coming down, Cells are also now moving in to build the new one, okay? So I said, if you're in the middle of this, it looks like chaos. It's like, oh my God, the whole thing's falling apart. And I go, yeah, but guess what? As it's falling apart, a new one is being built. We are in the cocoon pupa stage at this moment. The caterpillar that we've been is destructive anymore. Pushed it, can't do it. What do we have to do? We have to transform. I say, how do you do that? take the structure of the caterpillar, you bring it down, and you build up the structure of the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And I say, but they're happening at the same time. Well, that's the confusing part, because then you as a bystander in the middle can look one way and go, oh my God, it's falling apart. And then you can look the other way and go, oh my God, look what they're building. And I say, so where are we? Well, most people are, oh my God, it's falling apart. I go, wrong place to put your energy, your vibration. Pull out of that. Start to look like, don't participate, because there's something being built out here that's so much better. One of the most important principles of science is that our consciousness is creating our life experiences. And yet, when you talk to people and you say, how's your life going? It's like, well, it's not really going the way I would like it to go. And then comes the most important question. I say, well, what is it you really want? You know what's interesting? You can ask people that question. Most people respond saying, well, I don't want this and I don't want that. And I go, no, what is it you want? And I go, they never really focus on what they want. They just see what's not working and say they don't want that. And I go, but what does this lead to? I say, well, if you're focusing on what you don't want, you know, I don't want this. And I say, you know, there's a picture in your mind that corresponds to what you just said. Your mind sees an image. I don't want X, I don't want Y. And I go, well, that image you just said you don't want is an image in the brain whose function it is is to translate that image into reality because consciousness is created in reality, which means, hey, the placebo effect is a reality based on positive consciousness. And everybody goes, yeah, positive thinking can heal me of any disease. And I go, yeah, that's conscious creation. What we don't talk about is that negative consciousness manifests equally powerfully as positive consciousness, but it works in the opposite direction. And it's called nocebo effect. It's just an expression that negative thought manifests negative reality. In the year 2018, astronaut Dr. Bruce Lipton set out on a voyage to save humanity upon the assumption that Earth was dying and humankind needed a new home. However, just prior to launch, new studies emerged from Chernobyl. The once devastated landscape has regrown. Nature has returned. Unfortunately, something went terribly wrong, and Dr. Bruce Lipton was sent into outer space. Many problems occurred, and Dr. Bruce Lipton became lost. Lost in the vastness of space. This is his journey. After 20 long years being lost in space, Bruce Lipton is finally coming home. 
Oh wow, what a welcoming sight. Look at that beautiful blue-green gem floating in the darkness of space. I'm going home. It's going to be great. Now if I could just get this ready for re-entry. Mission Control. Mission Control. Astronaut Bruce Lipton coming back home from the outer limits with our beautiful rocket ship. Please come in. I guess well, maybe they're, they're just busy right now, but... Well, I've got such a great story to tell them when I get back. Oh, fresh air, man. Being in that little can for 20 years out there. This, oh, it's so wonderful. Oh, it's beautiful. It is beautiful here. God, just think of it, how much time I spent out there in open space looking for another place for us to live, another planet, and I come back here and look at this, it is so beautiful. I didn't ever have to leave. Gosh, when I left here, this whole place seemed to be falling down. Man, the environment was collapsing all around us. The rainforests were being cut down. People were destroying the air, the water, the land. Look at it now. Wow, these people have really created something new. Ah, created something new. Well, that's not an accident. A creation is a participation. At that time when I left and the world looked like it was on its last stages, something happened. They, people must have learned how to change the world, but in order to do that, they first really had to learn how to change themselves. You really have to understand at some level, if we're going to create a garden like this, and somewhere along the line, we have to create the own garden in our own consciousness first. And that's where we start to come from reality. Humans have imagination. They can imagine a garden, but then humans have the ability to manifest. Recognize this, you have 50 trillion citizen cells living under your skin, a community that lives in harmony. If we really want to understand how to live in harmony, well, look within. That's where the answers are. How can 50 trillion cells provide for a happy, healthy human being? Because they understood the nature of community. It's a fractal universe, and fractal universe simply means this, a structure, a geometry of the universe that represents as above, so below. Meaning, if you understand the structure at any level, you can understand it at any other level. And so if we really want to understand how to create this beautiful planet, then we have to recognize this. How do the cells do it in our body? Because 50 trillion of them came together in a community and learned to live in harmony and provide for their environment. But then if we understand how the cells did it, then we can understand how the people can do it because we have to use the same principles, it's fractal, to change the planet and make it the garden that it has become right now. But then, of course, you can't get there if you don't know where you're going. So before we even embark on the trail, we must first visualize in our consciousness, what is it we're seeking? What are we trying to manifest? Where are we going? And once we get that picture in our mind, then we can become the artist to manifest that picture in the real world situation. And just by the looks of this garden, we obviously must have learned our lesson. And of course, where are these people? Uh, where are these people? Hello? 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 You maniacs! You finally did it! You blew it up! Damn you all to hell! Well, the other day I was going through my toy box and guess what I found? Something I hadn't seen for a long, long time. My wonderful, wonderful Etch-A-Sketch. Now, many of you may have had this when you were young as well, but I really loved it. You know why? It gave you an opportunity to make a drawing on this screen by turning these dials down here. And then after you complete the drawing, you can then shake it up and the drawing will disappear and you can make another drawing. So it was like a reusable pen and paper. Uh, just shake it and make a new one. So here, let's take a look at how you do it. And I'll try it. It's been a long time since I've done it, but uh, let me work at it. Here's how it works. 
So, well, you can see I'm a little out of practice on it, but here's the beautiful part. Here's a drawing that I just made, and I created this image and then manifested it on the screen of the Etch-a-Sketch. So what's really interesting is what I can do is now shake up this screen and erase the image, and then I can create another one. Perhaps this one is gonna be a little better than the last one. Let's see what I can do this time. Well, what a great picture, but what we can do is just shake it up and... Oh! Oh, 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 what the hell is going on behind me? Oh, oh my God, the world is collapsing. So why is this relevant? Because there's a lot we can learn about evolution through an Etch-a-Sketch. Wow, what we're experiencing right now is a process called evolution. Well, it's not the evolution we learned in school, the Darwin version. That's the kind of evolution that says evolution has gradual changes over billions of years, imperceptible, but over a long time, you see an outcome that's different. In contrast to the old version of evolution, the gradualism version, there's a new understanding of evolution called punctuated equilibrium. Uh, this is a theory that was devised by Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge. And what did they recognize is that when looking for fossils, there were different layers where fossils of animals that no longer exist. And then there's like a space. And then there's another layer with fossils of animals that no longer exist. And then another space. And they said, well, there's something going on. There's a development a punctuation, another development, and a punctuation. The punctuations are natural events that destroyed the nature and the web of life at that time. And in fact, the last one of these mass extinctions is attributed to a giant comet that hit near the Yucatan Peninsula and upended the web of life. And at that last extinction, 66 million years ago, remember before the comet hit, the planet was filled with lush tropical forests and dinosaurs. After the comet hit, they don't exist anymore. The strata that we see in the fossils is really the same story as we see in the Etch-a-Sketch. The strata means that something happened, there was a picture, then the picture changed, and a new picture formed on the next strata. And then that picture changed. The understanding about the nature of the Etch-a-Sketch and what's actually going on in our world right now are really the same story. We've created an image, it's not sustainable, and, and the Etch-a-Sketch is shaking, but the planet is shaking. The planet is telling us that civilization you have created is no longer sustainable, and it's time for us to create a more thrivable situation for us to move into the future. There's an old saying, there's no such thing as a new story. Well, in fact, interesting point, we can go back a thousand years and start to recognize that the Buddhists were telling us the same story in a different fashion. They were making what are called sand mandalas. And these are very ornate creations from different sands, instead of paint, different sand, creating a structure and then making this most beautiful structure. And they also recognize, just like the universe is, things don't always stay the same. So after they create this most beautiful expression, then they take all the sand and scoop it all together, make a big pile and start all over again for another image. Just as in the story with the mandala and the same story in the Etch-a-Sketch and the same story that we're experiencing on this planet right now, there's a very important point that says that we can move into the future, but take with us what we learned from the past to build a better future, to thrive into that future. And this is where we are right now. Shaking it up so that civilization come together in a new version with love, harmony, and peace. While we're in this state of chaos, it's a very important point about you, the observer of what I've just been talking about. I go, why is this important? Because you represent cultural creatives. You are the people that are looking for answers to how to get into the future from the destruction we're facing right now. And the answers are not in the box. So just by even watching what we're talking about right here is the idea to give you the insight of how powerful you are in creating the new future. Your participation is involved in this evolution. This is not a passive event you sit at home and wait for evolution. This is where we go out and manifest evolution. And just like in the story of the Etch-a-Sketch, you can put your hands on the dial and start to create a new image as well. And so collectively, when we all work together, the new image is a new civilization, one that can take us from today into a future. This is the moment of manifesting a new civilization, not just for the people, but for Mother Nature herself. And this is our opportunity to participate in conscious evolution. To learn how to relax and manifest things into your life, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. 
continue to believe, and I'll see you there. What you focus on with your thoughts, your brain will manifest as reality. Everything you do in your life, you put out energy for. Therefore, start to review what you're doing in your life. Because if you're putting your energy in